Hello. Hi. Good morning. Ah, here's the microphone. Good morning, everyone. Welcome back. I hope you're well rested. I have a short announcement to make. Um, the members' assembly tomorrow, the voting, is all electronic. So please remember to bring your devices, your electronic devices. You should have received an email with a code that allows you to access the technology that will then allow you to vote. And this is something that I will and others will keep repeating over and over today and also tomorrow because we don't want to have a voting chaos at the assembly and neither do you, I'm pretty sure. And now, as everyone is entering a little late, I'm about to hand over to Pia. Maybe just for the latecomers, if you can quickly listen to. <laughs> I think you should repeat it again. <laughs> I should repeat it again. OK, I just said I will repeat things. So let's take a moment. This one is here. Okay, here's another welcome. Um, just as friendly as the first one. And I repeat a piece of um, important information, namely for tomorrow, the members' assembly. Please bring your electronic devices because all elections, all voting will be done electronically, even for you who are here in person. You should have received via email a code that allows you to access the voting technology. So please, please, please remember to bring your electronic devices so that we can vote electronically, everyone, those in presence and those via Zoom. And now I'm happy to hand over to Pia. Okay. Hello, good morning, everybody. Uh, it's my great pleasure, my great, great pleasure, I should say, <laughs> to introduce to you uh, today's keynote speaker, Mita Banerjee. Uh, I will just very briefly start um, on a very personal note because um, Mita Banerjee, like no other scholar, I can say, profoundly influenced my perspective on an approach to American studies. It's safe to say that without her, I would not be here today, academically, that is. Um, but that shall not be the topic today. So, um, for more than a decade now, Mita Banerjee has been Professor of American Studies at the Obama Institute of Transnational American Studies at the Johannes Gutenberg University, Mainz. Prior to that, she was Professor of American Studies at the University of Siegen and received um, a prestigious uh, Aminuta grant for a postdoctoral visit at the University of California at Berkeley. Um, she won numerous awards, among them um, a dissertation prize, the best paper award uh, by the journal uh, America Studien American Studies, and a teaching award. In 2010, she was instrumental in founding uh, the Center for Comparative Native and Indigenous Studies at Mainz University, which explores approaches to indigenous studies from an interdisciplinary as well as transnational perspective. Since 2014, uh, Mita Banerjee has been the co-speaker of the research training group Life Sciences, Life Writing, Boundary Experiences of Human Life Between Biomedical Explanation and Lived Experience. From 2016 to 2019, she was principal investigator uh, in the DFG research group Undoing Difference with a research project on centenarians' autobiographies. In 2020, she co-founded the research training group Digital Information Landscape and its Impact on Students' Online Learning. And as part of this group, she uh, works on a project entitled Narratives and Their Impact on Student Learning in Higher Education, Economics and Medicine. Since, 2000, uh, since 2021, she has also been PI at the DFG-funded Collaborative Research Center, the SFB, Studies in Human Categorization. 
In her research at the SFB, she explores how choreographies of age and achievement converge in current discourses on successful aging. As this brief overview already demonstrates, in her research, Mita Banerjee explores the intersections of American literary and cultural studies and other fields, especially medicine and the law, and more recently, economics. While this is already an impressive CV, um, I would now like to introduce you to a scholar who is, and I say this with deep admiration, but also with a pinch, and not just a pinch, of envy. <laughs> um, she's also an obsessive writer. I do not mean that she writes uncontrollably or in, uh, involuntarily, but that she writes impulsively and non-stop, like all the time, on all occasions, and on anything that will not object. She's probably writing right now, at least in her head. So the result is an incredibly impressive list of publications. Um, with few exceptions, Mita Banerjee publishes a monograph every three years. Yes, every three years. It began in 2002 with the Chutneyfication of History, Salman Rushdie, Michael Ondaatje, and Bharati Mukherjee, and the post-colonial debate. Then followed, in 2005, Racing the Century, a tour de force through 20th century American literature, film, music, and art, and the processes of racialization these cultural productions um, engage in. My favorite book is Ethnic Ventriloquism, Literally Minstrelsy in 19th Century American Literature, published in 2008. In this monograph, Mita Banerjee uh, argues that 19th century ethnic ventriloquism can be read as a form of democratic self-inspection. And I quote, it's not only that the white subject speaks in an ethnic voice, but, it that, but that it speaks about itself in an ethnic voice. End quote. So this act of impersonation then is a form of self-scrutiny uh, through the eyes or rather the mouth of an imagined other. And um, this is a concept I find really, really useful to work with in a variety of um, contexts. Next in line is Color Me White, Naturalism, Naturalization in American Literature, published in 2013. So there's a bit of a gap. <laughs> I acknowledge this. <laughs> Almost every three years, I said. Uh, here, Mita Banerjee is interested in the distinction and conflation of literature and law, more precisely in the parallels between the literary movement of naturalism and legal discourses of naturalization and citizenship. Her next two books indicate a shift in her research interests and coincide with her work at the research training group Life Sciences, Life Writing. They both aim at establishing a dialogue between the humanities and the life, and life sciences. In 2018, uh, she published Medical Humanities in American Studies, Life Writing, Narrative Medicine, and the Power of Autobiography. And more recently, in uh, 2020, Biologische Geisteswissenschaften, eine Einführung. So I wonder what her next book um, <laughs> will be about, and it will hopefully be published um, next year, I guess. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, I could spend an equal amount of time talking about her many edited volumes that range from contributions to transnational American studies, comparative indigenous studies, to teaching uh, resources for high school students on India. Or I could keep, um, keep talking about the dozens and dozens of articles she has published in the Journal of Aging Studies, the Journal of Transnational American Studies, Frontiers of Education, Zeitschrift für Anglistik and Amerikanistik, Studies in Higher Education, not to mention the chapters in edited volumes published with Routledge, Bloomsbury, Transcript, Winter, and Cambridge UP. But I stop here. So, in her keynote, today entitled Towards an Asian German Studies, Korean Nurses, Deep Maps, and Popular Culture, Mita Banerjee brings together live narratives by Korean nurses, Shelley Fisher Fishkin's uh, notion of deep maps, and the German detective series, Wolfsrevier. <laughs> I am very much looking forward to that, so please uh, welcome Mita Banerjee. <laughs> Hi, 
Can you hear me? Is this working? Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm, I was thinking um, what time in my life I've been more terrified than now. Uh, there are a few. Um, I'm just really, really grateful to Pia for this really kind introduction. I'm super grateful to Astrid Franke, Uwe Küchler, and um, Katharina Luther for inviting me. I'm really grateful to you for being here this early on a Friday. Um, and, okay, I had, you know, of course, you know, every night before a talk like that, you lie awake and you think of all the things that you could do to de deconstruct your own talk and yourself. So, you know, my caveat for this talk is, I was trying to really trace my own journey through American studies. And, you know, so I was kind of thinking, how did I get to that point? And so many of the things are really, really my own journey of recapturing, you know, things that I've been working on. So many of the things I will say, you know, will completely be obvious to you. So just bear with me. Also, I'm really happy because there's so many people in this room from whose work I've learned so much and continue to learn. So I hope, you know, this could be a conversation. Okay. I'll start with a confession. As a child growing up, every Saturday afternoon, I watched the films of Charlie Chan. And, you know, this is actually, Charlie Chan is the worst Asian caricature that you can think of. And I think, you know, most of you will not be familiar with him anymore. But you can tell from the poster that, you know, this is the epitome of sort of yellow-faced minstrelsy. And when I think back on this, these moments every Saturday afternoon, I think back of myself with a mixture of shame and complicity, because I knew even then that something was wrong with Charlie Chan. You know, I didn't know the term yellow-faced minstrelsy, but I did see, you know, this was a white actor, uh, Warner Oland, who had taped eyelids and buck teeth. So, you know, it couldn't get any worse than that. And Charlie Chan spoke broken English, uh, he was completely inscrutable, so you could never tell what he was thinking. Actually, that made him such a good detective. He was also cunning. So when you looked at him, it was with a mixture of repulsion, but also fascination. And, you know, so I, I like to think even then, I knew something was wrong with myself looking at this caricature of an Asian man. And the only thing I can say in my defense is that even then, I think, I was looking for Asian-German presences. And the closest I could get was through the detour of US popular culture. So Charlie Chan was really all I had. My second confession is that I wasn't always in American studies. Actually, when I first enrolled a thousand years ago, in my first semester at Mainz, I started in German studies. And I, you know, went to my first lecture. I was, you know, very shy. I went up to the professor and I said, can I work on migrant literature here? And he said, no, you know, we, you know, Goethe, Schiller, Lessing. That's what we do. And I remember feeling deeply ashamed because I'd stepped outside or fallen outside a frame that I didn't even know existed. And he looked at me with a mixture of pity and amusement. So I disenrolled a week after that. And what saved me was that I enrolled in American studies. And I found that in American studies, I was able to talk about all the things that I would have also liked to talk about in German studies, about multi-ethnicity, about migration. And then what saved me even more was that then American studies itself changed with the transnational turn in American studies. And this was at the ASA many years ago, 2004. So Shella Fischer-Fishkin, who was then president of the American Studies Association, you know, gives this talk, and it's a, it's a room packed. And she's getting up there, and then she says, actually, there's as many scholars, there's a, a, as many versions of American studies as there are people in this room. And I, you know, even as a PhD student then, I thought something has shifted. Because for those of us in Germany, it meant that our work was no longer just derivative of the US American studies, the real American studies. But you know, we were all Americanists in our own right, and comparative work became possible to a degree that, you know, you know or, or became even more possible. Okay. 
So then, it was that transnational turn in American studies that took me to my own search for Asian German studies. And I'll, I'll refer in this talk to a lot of really stupid, really trivial German detective shows, so I apologize. There'll also be clips. Um, so my own thinking about Asian German studies really came out of transnational American studies. And one day, I was watching a show that I really used to like, Stube von Fall zu Fall. Okay, it's, it's really bad. So, but it's about an East German detective who's exiled in Hamburg. Okay, so he's looking for his own identity. And in one show, one episode, there was this Indian taxi driver. And he was completely bizarre. He didn't make sense. He didn't speak any German. And if he spoke, you know, whatever he said didn't make sense. So I thought at the time, if there was an Asian German studies, just as there is an Asian American studies, then I would have the vocabulary to say, that's a racialist caricature. And, you know, this is something that goes much deeper than popular culture. And so I was wondering, what if we invented an Asian German studies on the basis of an Asian American studies and used that as a vocabulary to talk about Germany and not just popular culture? And incidentally, so now I'm retracing, you know, Asian American studies. You know, Asian American studies literally started by killing off Charlie Chan. So Jessica Hagedorn's anthology is called Charlie Chan is Dead. So it's over the dead body of Charlie Chan that Asian American voices arose. So then I thought, if we were to invent an Asian German studies, that would mean, though, that we would have to take into account both the similarities and the differences between the US and Germany when it comes to talking about race. And here, I would sort of refer to the work of Fatima al Tayeb, who said that actually race, because of the German history, has become unspeakable. So that's why we would use the English term race. So that in itself is significant, I think. Okay, and now before I come to the first clip, you know, I've been obsessed with popular culture, and you know, many of you work on popular culture, so that's stating the obvious, but for me, like all other cultural texts, popular culture is the seismograph, right? So I'm interested in how trivial detective shows, as trivial as Stube, will register social shifts that I want to track. And second, I want to pin down the dominant discourse. So I think so much about the dominant culture is revealed in the trivial stories that popular culture uh, will tell us. Okay. So this is where it gets more practical. So I want to show you a clip from this film, Wolf's Revier. It's just a detective show about Wolf, right? Who's the detective? And it's set in Berlin, so this is his Revier. And this episode is from, um, you know, this scene is from an episode entitled Death of a Nurse. Here it goes. Okay. Okay. And of course, at the end of this talk, I will reveal who killed her. Okay. But you can already, you know, spoiler. <laughs> so here I am, I'm still, I mean, in a way, I haven't come that far from Charlie Chan. I'm still looking for Asian characters in German popular culture. And I found one. So I found Moon, who is 21 years old, and she's a nurse. So at this point, I found an Asian presence on German television, and there's a recognition in popular culture that there is work migration from Korea. So what I want to ask in this talk is that there is a recognition of Moon's work, but I want to ask, is there also a reconstruction, a recognition of her life as an Asian-German life? And so, you know, it's a detective series, so they're going to have to reconstruct the murder but are they also going to be able to reconstruct her life as Asian German? And because it's a detective show, of course, they have to interview all kinds of witnesses and, you know, to find out who did it and why. And throughout the film, all the characters that we, you know, get to know and who talk about Moon Lee are all white characters. She's always portrayed through white eyes. And this is the first witness, okay? You have to, you know, maybe she's the murderer, we don't know. And the first witness is Schwester Hannelore. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's pretty bad, but... Hello. So at this point, I need 
Asian American studies to deconstruct this scene. Okay, so without Asian American studies, I wouldn't have the recovery to say what I'm going to say. Uh, namely, that of course, you know, the entire, you know, Moon is stereotypical all the way. So the first characteristic, of course, is she's mysterious. So that's actually the, one of the key concepts of stereotypes in Asian American studies. And of course, I'm interested in how stereotypes travel. So Edward Said in Orientalism has said, you know, the Oriental is first an Oriental, second a human being, and then again an Oriental. So the same might be applied, I think, to Moon, this trivial character in a German detective show. You know, Charlie Chan was made in 1935. Okay, I wasn't alive in 1935. I was watching the reruns. But, you know, all this, you know, this way through from the U.S. popular culture to German popular culture today, the stereotype of the Asian character as mysterious is still in place. So it, it has obviously traveled to Germany. So Moon is inscrutable, right? So Charlie Chan is, of course, such a good detective because you, you can never tell what he's thinking. So inscrutability also works. But I want to make another point about Schwester Hannelore. I, I will say things that are much worse about her. So the thing is that I think from the very beginning, Moon is the counter image to this white German woman because Schwester Hannelore flirts with the detective. And Moon, you know, can't flirt because she's dead, but also because she's never thought of in the film as a love interest. And that's something I'll come back to, okay? So now, at this point, we might say, okay, Schwester Hannelore, you know, maybe she just thought that way about Moon Lee because she didn't know her well. The second witness is Schwester Inge. And Schwester Inge, you know, by her own account, was Moon's best friend. <laughs> Alles gut? Okay. This is Schwester Inge. And she's crying because her friend just died. So, of course, the second stereotype, which is very much... Can, can you tell me if something's... Okay. Uh, so, the this, this second you know, witness actually says the same thing. Even though she was her best friend, she says, you know, Moon just has a lack of passion. She's not passionate. Charlie Chan, of course, has five sons, you know, all of whom sort of are numbered and don't have names, but Charlie Chan is not passionate. So Moon is not only mysterious, but she's completely dispassionate. You never know what she's feeling. Maybe she doesn't have any feelings. So Moon, even for Schwester Inge, who's her, own, you know, her best friend, Moon is a counter image to Schwester Inge because she's not passionate. You, know, you can just never know. So what I would like to do in the remainder of this talk, I want to deconstruct this image. So I'm looking for historical depth because I'm saying that the film recognizes Moon's labor. You know, she's a Korean nurse. But the film can't imagine her life. So I want to reconnect. I'm looking for archives. I'm looking for sources, for alternative narratives to connect, to reconnect Moon's life to her labor. And so in the search for, in the search for alternative archives, I want to look at... <laughs> I want to look at, I'm going to look. Okay, I'll just keep talking. So, in the search for alternative archives, I want to look at self-representations, at life-writing narratives by Korean nurses. I want to superimpose these life-writing narratives by Korean nurses onto Wolfsrevier. And I'm indebted here to the work of Yu Jae Lee, who's a professor of Korean studies here in Tübingen, and who's interviewed Korean miners who came to Germany at the same time that Korean nurses did. And I'll say more about them in a second. I'm also indebted to the work of Heike Werner, who interviewed Korean nurses. And she's actually an Americanist. I met her many years ago here at the DGFA. And what she said was that she's going to use the methodology of American studies, including oral history. She went to New York, did an oral history project, went back. She, that's Heike on the photo. And she interviewed Korean nurses to collect their life writing narratives. And third, I want to show you an excerpt from, from a film. And this is a film that was made by a Korean student of nursing about Korean nurses in Germany on the occasion of the 60th anniversary of these nurses coming to Germany.
And the film, okay, happily for me, it's in English, right? Because otherwise, I, would have not, I wouldn't have access you know, to these narratives. But second, and more importantly even, the film is called The Passion of Korean Nurses. So Wolf Slavia says, you know, Moon, you know, it's so dispassionate. The film says, okay, these were, you know, migrant workers, you know, who were so passionate about the work, you know, and actually the Bild Zeitung at the time titled Asiatinen retten die deutsche Pflege, okay? So this film is really all about the passion of these nurses, and it's a completely different image, and I'll show you a short clip. And in this film, this is what you, you know, I have no time to show you, but they went to the Frankfurter Römer, and there was a reception by the mayor, you know, and they were wearing the tra traditional dresses that they wore when they first came. So what I want to ask about this passage from this, this film, in Wolf's Revier, the idea is that Moon is so inscrutable, obviously she's not talking to anybody. So she's basically self-segregating, okay? She doesn't want to have anything to do with the German nurses. In this image that we just saw, Sun Ja Kim, you know, has a counter-narrative to that because she's basically saying, you know, these were young women, you know, they were abroad for the first time, they were really lonely, they were working incredibly hard shifts, some of them like 48-hour shifts, you know, and they were passionate about you know, helping their patients. And so, you know, Sun Ja Kim's narrative reconnects these nurses' labor to their lives. And she basically says, you know, they were working these really long hours, you know, the German nurses were sort of staying among themselves, and so in between, you know, the Korean nurses were so lonely, they went to the restroom and cried their eyes out, right? So, and of course then, the German nurses would make fun of their eyes. Actually, the eyes, of course, are the stereotypical image of racialization, right? Um, so what you have is actually not self-segregation, but it's exclusion, okay? So it's a completely different narrative. At the same time, though, it's important also for me not to say that these nurses, or not only to say that these nurses were excluded and so these were stories of victimization, because it's also important to say these were also stories of agency, and I'll come back to that, because the Korean nurses said, you know, they, they migrated to Germany, that was a, their own choice, their decision that they made in their lives. So, you know, it was also, you know, these are also stories of pride and of achievement, and I'll come back to that. So basically, I want to ask, and this is where it's a short recap of history that you all know, but I wanted to just sort of recap this here. I want to ask, so the film says, you know, Moon is there in Berlin. I want to ask, what is the history behind this? And actually, the film doesn't show us that. So I want to ask, why is Moon even in Germany? And what is the trajectory of work migration? And this is a film from a Korean archive, you know, that is hosted in the East-West Foundation. Um, actually, something I forgot to say, but I will say now, is this. I'm working with Shelley Fisher Fishkin's concept of deep maps. That was on my slide a couple of minutes ago, but I forgot to say it. <laughs> Shelley Fisher Fishkin said, when she inaugurated deep maps, this is digital palimpsest mapping projects. She said, today, we have access to so many different archives, and they're all over the world, but, you know, digital humanities, we have access to these spaces. They may be in different languages, you know, and they're hosted on different websites. But what I'm trying to do in this project is really also to look for deep maps. So here I am, I'm trying to find, you know, narratives by Korean nurses, and how to frame this, these narratives. And I find one, this is the official Korean historiography, on a site by the East-West Foundation um, that I want to show you a clip from. Okay. Also, it has English um, voiceover.
South Korea, a small nation with few natural resources, but filled with manpower and determination. Its economy in the 1960s was in shambles after the bloody Korean War. Who would have known that the miraculous development of South Korea sprung from the efforts of less than 20,000 workers? In the early 1960s, the Park regime dispatched around 20,000 Koreans to Germany to work as miners and nurses. In exchange for their contribution to the miracle of the Rhine, they brought back German investments and development funds that made the miracle of the Han River possible. The Korean work. Sorry. So this is my brief re recap of history, because at this point, Korean work migration, and actually this is the reason why Moon is in Germany and in Berlin for the in, the in the first place, starts with the Korean War. You know, as a Stellvertreterkrieg proxy war, this is something that you know all of you know um, between the Soviet Union and the U.S., which basically you know laid sort of uh, South Korea in ruins. So this is the this was actually the incentive of Korean Germ Korean miners and nurses to migrate in the first place, and and so you know 20,000 miners and workers came to Germany. Um, this was you know 9,000 9, miners and 11,000 nurses. And what I think is interesting about this clip is that it's a transnational history. So me, I just knew I knew all about post-war German history, but I had no clue about Korean history. So this is a deep map, right? That you know, the miracle of the Rhine, which makes me happy because I'm from Mainz, you know, I, and I didn't even know the term that that was miracle of the Rhine. That was made possible by you know migrant labor, and I'll say more about that in a sec. But also by Korean nurses who saved, right, saved nursing in post-war Germany. But that migration, in turn, made possible the miracle of the Han River, right? So they, I mean, the official narrative is that they were rebuilding Korean economy. Uh, actually, now, you know, recent historiography says it was a little bit more complicated, because these were not pawns in the hands of the Korean government. You know, it was actually individual choices, and it was a lot more complicated than that. But at the same time, the post-war German Wirtschaftswunder, right? The boom, and there's so many historians that I'm embarrassed, of course, to say that, because uh, you know much better than me. But that boom was made possible also through Korean work migration. But that work migration also changed the history of South Korea. Okay. So what I want to look at in, in this slide for a couple of minutes is to retrace German work history um, after the war. And of course, as you know, the Anwerbeabkommen, right, in, in inviting foreign labor, went out by post-war Germany to workers from Italy, Greece, Spain, Turkey, and Korea. So I'm also interested in another deep map that I don't have time for, in the way that these narratives intersect. So many of the things that I'm saying about Korean nurses, I was only able to reconstruct by looking at um, narratives by Turkish-German workers, okay? but they're just in different archives. So I'm interested, and of course, I don't know all the languages, but I'm interested in how they intersect. And that Anwerbeabkommen started the myth of the guest worker, okay, which for me is one of the most insidious myths in post-war German history. Because the idea was, of course, famously, that the people wanted the labor, but not the lives of these workers. So from the very beginning, there were exclusionist policies First, there was a mandatory return policy. You had to return after three years. Then you could extend your stay, um, but your family wasn't allowed to come with you and join you. So from the very beginning, that was the myth of return. And I want to read this moment in post-war German history through Asian American studies, because in Asian American studies, you had bachelor societies. So that's a concept that has been studied in Asian American history, where men you know, went to the US to work, were housed in, you know, Chinatown sections, and, you know, many of you have worked about this. And, you know, the idea that Nian Sha has looked at was that because of racialist exclusion policies, like the Chinese Exclusion Act, you know, you had bachelor societies. But Nian Sha also said, yes, these were spaces of exclusion, but these were also spaces where migrant workers created their own sense of community. These were spaces of closeness, of intimacy, also of queer desires. But this was you know, a life that, in this bachelor society, workers forged for themselves. 
So I want to ask what happened, what would happen if we applied that vision of bachelor societies to German work migration? Because all these migrants' narratives, you know, migrants by Turkish and Greek and Spanish and Korean workers, say the same thing. They were housed in dormitories. As a migrant worker, you were housed in a room of eight people. There was a lot of times no warm water, so that made it easier for you to not want to stay. And you had access, you were eligible for three square meters of the floor in this room and for 10 square meters of air to breathe. And of course, you had to pay you know, an extraordinary amount of rent. But in the narratives, though, you know, of these workers, they all say, but there was a sense of community. You know, we were just by, by ourselves, but you know, we forged a type of kinship. So that's how we were able to survive. Okay, what does all of this have to do with Moon Lee? She lives in a dorm. Um, you know, all the scenes that I can't show you because I will run out of time is that you have many, um, you know, accounts by Korean nurses of how they actually forged this kind of community among themselves. They explained to each other how to use a washer and, you know, all these things that German nurses wouldn't tell them about. And I'm interested here in the connection between the law and popular culture. Because Ian Hani Lopez has said in White by Law, there's a double bind between the social and the legal. Because the law turns into law, social practices that already exist. And then by becoming law, it perpetuates these practices. So I would argue that actually, at the time, you know, you know in, in Moon Lee's story, in this stupid detective show, Wolfsrevier, the show cares about her labor and not her life. And that is the essence of the law of the guest worker. So actually, this trivial show perpetuates the idea that these workers, you know, okay, there's their labor, we need their labor, but we don't want their life. And so that actually justifies the guest worker myth and the law that was prevalent at the time. Okay. So actually, Wolf's Revier, and this is where we come back to Wolf finally, you know, shows us, you know, doesn't show us anything about Moon's life, but it the only lives that we are drawn into, that we empathize with, and the, you know, we get to know more about, are white German lives, such as the life of Dr. Lohnert, the person who, you know, the nurse said was so good looking. Okay, judge for yourself. Uh -huh. So, and I like that he's wearing a bathrobe. So, um, so this, you know, is, my, is another stereotype, of course, that I talked about at the very beginning, that the Asian character is never a love interest, right? So, you know, um, and I want to look at, you know, Alexandra, you saw her now, she's the crown princess, right? She, she's, you know, uh, she has an affair with uh, Dr. Lonat. And I want to deconstruct this moment where the Asian character, not just because she's dead, but it doesn't occur to this, to this episode that she could be a love interest. I want to deconstruct that moment, and I want to deconstruct that moment not just through Asian American studies, but also through African American studies. So, for instance, Toni Morrison in The Bluest Eye you know, writes about Piccola, who loves Shirley Temple and wants to have blue eyes, because Shirley Temple, who's blonde and has blue eyes, is the essence of beauty for Piccola. And I want to look at this moment in this trivial show, Wolf's Revier, through the Dolls Experiment, of the 1950s by Kenneth and Mamie Clark, you know, who gave black children a black doll and a white doll, and they said, as you know, which one is the beautiful doll? And the black children said, the white one. And they said, which one is the ugly doll? And they pointed to the black doll. And then the psychologist said, which doll looks like you? So I think there's a moment, you know, of how race and beauty intersect. So this is my revenge on Schwester Hannelore and Schwester Inge and the Crown Princess through whiteness studies, through Asian American studies and through African American studies, because I would like to say, and this is, you know, um, for many different reasons, a <laughs> historical moment, you know, because I grew up worshipping these characters, you know, because they were so beautiful to me. And so I want to say that it's not that Schwester Hannelore and Schwester Inge and the Crown Princess Alexandra 
happen to be beautiful. But I want to say that because they're, you know, they're, they're actually beautiful, or they're framed as beautiful, because they are white. Okay, that was my revenge. <laughs> and finally, I want to say, you know, this can be connected to the discourse of yellow parallelism, because as Gina Marchetti has said in Romance and the Yellow Peril, you know, there can't be Asian, for a long time, also in the history of U.S. cinema, Hollywood cinema, there can't be romance involving Asian characters, because that eventually would lead to intermarriage, and that's always a threat for the white order and for the nuclear family. Um, and actually then, again, I was looking at migrant narratives by Turkish-German workers, and there were surveys done as late as the 1980s, where you know, people on the street were asked, would you let your son or daughter marry a foreigner, Ausländer? And 65% said no. You know, this is 1980s, right? So that sentiment is very much there. Uh, and, and the idea was, you know, intermarriage was just inconceivable. But I want to again superimpose the life narratives by Korean nurses onto this question. You know, can there be romance between Asian characters and white characters, in this case, white men? Okay, and this is a clip from the passion of Korean nurses. 오셨지만 그때로 다시 돌아가신다면 그때로 다시 돌아간다면 당장에 집에 돌아가겠어요. 그런데 지금 이렇게 이 자리에서 보면 또 우리 여기 있는 가족들이 있기 때문에 또 여기가 머무는 곳이고요. 그래서 항상 절반 절반이에요. So I want to superimpose the narrative of Sung Suk Kim, you know, onto this trivial Wolf's Revier show because of the 11,000 nurses who came to Germany, two-thirds stayed, and only one-third returned. And many of them married white German men, and you know, made their home, made their families. Uh, so this is the exact opposite of what Wolfsrevier would suggest. Also, you know, um, Lee Jin Min, who you saw briefly in the film at the beginning, she was the nursing student who made the film. She asked the nurses a question that also Yuji Lee has asked you know, the minors and that Heike Banna has asked the nurses that they interviewed. They all asked the same question. If you, could do it, if you could do it again, what would you do differently? Would you still come? Knowing what would happen, would you still have come? And Sang Suk Kim said, actually the worst thing that one can imagine, she said, if I could turn back time, I would have gotten on a plane back to Korea the next day. I think there, there can be no worse indictment of German post-war politics of migration. But at the same time, and this is what I said earlier, these are also success stories. So they, they indict post-war German politics as a politics deeply racialized and exclusionary. But the, all of the nurses also say they're just really proud of what they have achieved, of the families that they have made. In Heike Berner's book, Zuhause, is entitled Zuhause, because many of the nurses are saying Germany to this day has never made them feel at home. But they have created another kind of home because they have their families, their kids are obviously German. So they forged this space. And um, you know, the second picture on the slide is of uh, Yoon Ha Hengjak Fischer, who was the president of the Association of Korean Nurses to Germany. And she said when she first came to Germany many years ago, She's a mother, single mother of two children, and that life she was able to forge for herself in Germany, she would have never been able to have in Korea. So these were possibilities that the nurses created. And it was also you know, a story of success and achievement. Okay. And before I reveal who was the murderer, I want to say one last thing. The main difference, we might argue, between Asian American studies and Asian German studies, Asian, Asian um, German st um, studies, is that unlike the US, Germany never had a civil rights movement. Okay, so Asian American studies grew out, as you know, of the civil rights movement. So I found myself looking for a civil rights movement in German history. And obviously, maybe there is none, but maybe that's also falling short of the real explanation, because actually, there were protests you know, by all kinds of different migrant communities 
against the so-called Ausländergesetz. So it's not that they didn't exist, but I would actually argue, and this is going to those of you who work in media studies, right? They were just not televised, okay? They were not made publicly accessible, and this is work for the archives, I think. So there was, um, you know, there were protests against immigration laws, both in 1981, so every time immigration law was reformed, and they kept saying, but these are just guest workers, right? So every time in 81 and in, in 91, there were revolts and protests, and you know, these were really huge movements, of which I could find no picture, because there are none. Or they must exist somewhere, but I haven't been able to find them. So at this point, I want to say one thing about Wolf's Revier that I should have told you at the beginning, because I, never, I haven't told you when this show was made. It was made in 1993, and this was after reunification. So if popular culture is a seismograph, then that's what it registers. Even in the film Wolf's Revier, one character says, oh, after the reunification, there's all these foreign elements in Berlin. And so this is why, I would argue, all of a sudden, you have an eruption of Korean work migration to Germany. So the film actually superimposes the long history of migration, which goes back to the 1960s, and the contemporary presence of guest workers in cities such as Berlin. So I want to ask if Moon, what would Moon have done in 1991, you know, or 1993, before she was killed, that is? I think she would have been shocked that after reunification, as you know, there was a resurgence of xenophobic violence, not only in Berlin. In 1991, in Hoyerswerda, as you know, uh, you know, the homes of workers from Mozambique were set on fire. And next to these homes of the workers from Mozambique, there were homes of Vietnamese German workers. In Mölln, um, you know, and there's a, there's a, a Denkmal, there's a statue commemorating that, uh, in 1992, the home of uh, a Turkish-German family was set on fire and two kids died, and they were 10 and 14 years old. At the same time, you had a huge wave of protests. For instance, in 1991, in Berlin, Vietnamese immigrant workers, the so-called Fremdarbeiterinnen, right, fighting for the right to stay, and um, Kini Ha, who's also in, in, um, here in Tübingen, has written a book Asiatische uh, Deutsche, about Vietnamese um, German history. So I want to argue, Moon, of course, she was in Berlin, right? She's a fictional character, but what if she wasn't? You know, she would have joined these protests, and she would have forged an alliance with Vietnamese German you know, workers. And so there would have been an Asian-German alliance, just as in the US, Asian-American Asian is, of course, an alliance of different Asian communities. And Moon Lee would have told the Vietnamese workers in Berlin, that the Korean nurses had fought for their right to stay as early as 1978. They were among the first Asian communities to win their right to stay. And this was because they collected signatures at the Kirchentag, Evangelische Kirchentag, um, in 1978. And they were so vocal, they were also so self-confident that they eventually won their right to stay, long before the miners did and long before the other ethnic communities in Germany did. So finally, I would say, and I'm nearing the end, um, I'll fast forward, you know, this is why, you know, all these workers who were protesting for the right to stay would have said, we need you to reconnect our labor to our lives. So you wanted our labor, now you, went, you have to admit our lives to stay, because we've long become German. And at this point, I want to say, who killed Moon Lee? Do you know? Okay, I'll show you anyways. <laughs> so in the end, I think, we hate Dr. Lona. I mean, Dr. Lona is so disgusting. I mean, there's no words. But I think even though we're disgusted at Dr. Lona, I think the caricature remains. I think that Moon Lee remains the kleine Korean Shakangsha, the little Korean nurse even though the detectives sympathize with her. But the caricature remains in place. In the end, she's actually, we might argue, she's killed by the model minority myth because she was so hardworking that she immediately detected that, you know, Dr. Lonat had made this mistake and, you know, that's why he had to kill her. 
At one point, though, at this point at least, one of the stereotypes is being deconstructed by the episode itself, because she was a love interest. Okay, he did have an affair with her, even if he, you know, she was in marriage material. But, you know, so at the end of the film, you know, the murder has been solved. You know, the murder has been reconstructed, but her life as an Asian German life has not been reconstructed. So ultimately, the film has been unable to reconnect her labor with her life. And therefore, you know, in 1993, the film remains completely sort of moored in the guest worker myth. Okay, and that's it. It would take until 1991, six more years, for Germany to finally officially admit that maybe it is an immigrant country. <laughs> and these are my last two slides. I want to ask, what, where would Moon Lee be if she hadn't been killed by the evil Dr. Lonat? Where would she be today? Not a virus. I sponge bodies of my patients when their fever is raging. I turn them over so their bodies won't get sores. I am not a virus. I pump air into their lungs so they can breathe. I comfort them when they are afraid. I am not a virus. I pray for them. And rejoice when they show signs of recovery. So this is my last slide. I think today, Moon Lee would be shocked that so many years later, anti-Asian sentiment would be at its all-time high during the pandemic. She would, of course, be part of the movement hashtag, I'm not a virus. She'd also be happy to say that this movement, I'm not a virus, is as present in the US as it is in Germany. So in this talk, I've tried to connect different spaces, uh, you know, the US, Germany, and Korea, to the concept of deep maps by saying how are all these different archives in conversations with each other. Um, in, in, and that makes all of these questions a collaborative project. You know, all of you have worked on so many aspects of this. So I want to ask, how can we bring this knowledge together? Um, and also, I want to, you know, in, an, in a longer project, you could look at return villages, because one third of Korean miners and nurses returned. And in Korea, they created German villages. Uh, and with their own narratives. So I want to say this is very much a transnational project which connects, you know, Korea. So a Korean nursing student makes a film that helps me reconstruct post-war German history. Um, and also this is about inter-ethnic alliances because at the same time that Korean nurses came to Germany, nurses from India also came. They were all racialized as Asiatische Pflegerinnen, right, as Asian care workers. But these nurses from India and from Korea never actually met each other because they were, you know, socialized differently and they all looked to the white community for acknowledgement. And UJ Lee, you know, brought them together at a conference in Tübingen in 2018, you know, to have look at a pan-Asian nursing conference and to look at their life nar narratives. And finally, I want to say there's many overlaps between of course, Asian German studies and black German studies, you know, because many of you are working in black German studies. So there's a similar dialogue between uh, the US and Germany when it comes to race and life narratives. And finally, the archives, you know, where such knowledge could be found would also be activist organizations such as Korientation, which started out in Berlin as a community organization, activist organization for Korean workers, Korean German workers but is now much more of a people of color uh, coalition. And as my last note, I want to say that when my father came to Germany many, many years ago, he didn't come as a guest worker, but he came as a student. But as a child growing up, you don't have a sign around your neck saying, I'm not a guest worker child, I just look like one. So for me, you know, American studies has helped me make sense of my own life, and for that, I'm just really grateful. Thank you.
Okay, thank you so much, Mita, for well, making us revisit and reconsider German history um, through the lens of transnational Asian American studies. Um, we have plenty of time, kind of, for questions. <laughs> no, we have uh, lots of time, so... <laughs> um, I'll just briefly um, explain the procedure. There should be a computer that um, allows me to see the chat room. Is that, yeah, this one? Okay, perfect. So we can have um, questions uh, both via Zoom and in this room. Uh, for those of you who join us online, please type in your question in the chat and then I will read it out, okay? Um, I'll give um, people in online a little bit of time, so um, maybe we'll, <laughs> we'll start with uh, questions here. Yes, there's already one. Thank you, Mita, for such an interesting and accessible talk. Um, I was wondering about uh, language. so. Uh, did these nurses from India and Korea, did they, could they speak German or did they have the possibility of learning German? Because if you didn't speak the language, we know you cannot really express yourself, right? So you, in, in, um, you, you sort of would look obviously dispassionate and uh, introverted a, a bit, zuruk halten sowieso, right, if you don't speak the language. And of course, there is no possibility of passion if you <laughs> have no means of expression. So I was wondering, uh, yeah, if the, the, about their German skills. Right, I mean, thank you so much. I mean, so this is actually sort of a super interesting and, and very complex question. So because they said that actually um, many of them had actually been learning German. I mean, so these were people, I mean, they were highly educated. I mean, so, you know, because Ria had a very good nursing education, which why, th that was ideal. And so many of them had actually been le learning German. Uh, so so uh, even though their families were very poor, they were educated. Um, but at the same time, as you're saying, you know, the language problem was, you know, again, it was a barrier at the beginning, right? But actually immediately, and this is really interesting, they found German friends. So this is also what the film doesn't say. Uh, so they would make German friends. And also I'm interested, so this, you know, for a project that obviously I wouldn't be able to do, to look at, so there's different stages, right? Um, of, their, of their life in Germany. So to contrast early narratives by Korean nurses in Korean, that they would have shared you know, with, their, with their friends, with their fellow workers, to the stories they were able to tell in German. You know, so, so you're very right, right? So I think that this is what is interesting to me is that no, you know, that's not talked about, right? In official German historiography, because you know, these were guest workers, so nobody looks at the intersections, right? So I think you know, you're very right that that would be you know, a place to go. Okay, I already have five um, questions or hands up on my list. Uh, the first one is up there. Yes. Yeah, thank, thank you also for this uh, very entertaining and enlightening talk. I have uh, three brief points. One, one is, can you maybe say something about the attractiveness of, of Asian American detectives in the 1930s? There's Mr. Moto, of course, too, with Peter Loray, and then... My, my experience in the 1970s, the Kung Fu series, which is also highly problematic, on the other hand, a very, I think, seen as a very positive character by, by many young people. Um, one, while I, while I found your reading of, of the Wolfsrevier convincing, I think some of that, however, is extremely stereotypical of, of um, these types of crime series. So it could have been a woman from a different social class, and you would have basically is the, the very same thing said about her, um, why he wouldn't want to marry her and, and everything else. And third, um, you only very briefly in one of your last slides mentioned, mentioned the Vietnamese guest workers, the Vertragsarbeiterin. Since you always talked about Germany, you basically only talked about West Germany. So I think some would be similar, but it would also complicate the story. But maybe you can say a few words about that. Yes. Yeah, thank you so much. So, so uh, I entirely agree. Uh, I'll start with the last question. So I think there's a whole section in, in a longer version of the paper um, about the GDR, right? Because I think the interesting thing, and I sort of conflated it here because I, I was trying to save time, but I think you're very right because we would have had to, we would have to read the history of Fremdarbeiterinnen in the GDR you know, in that specific genealogy, right? Which, you know, with Vietnamese, uh, you know, workers specifically, with all the, you know, communist sort of underpinning. And so, so in a project that I would have to do in conversation with historians, um, to, to look at how uh, were these narratives similar, but also how were they very different in the GDR. And I guess I would be interested in, in Berlin, at that moment of reunification, how they would convert 
And, and, but you're very right, in the, it's very complicated. Um, and, and, uh, sort of, and that would be a research project in itself. Um, and second, about the, the stereotypical quality, yes. Right? I mean, I think it would have been, you know, as you're saying, in terms of race, but also in terms of class. Um, you know, there, there would be, you know, popular culture is stereotypical, that's true. But I guess I'm, I'm trying to reconstruct sort of, part, I'm, I'm, there's all stereotypes, but in my Asian German reading, I was trying to say, how are they specific to Asian racialization? And you're right, the same could be made about classist undertones, right? So I guess I'm interested in saying it's not just, yes, it is stereotypical, but how is the stere is, is it, is our stereotypes marshaled in a particular way? You know, because actually they, they can also shift. And actually, that's why I'm so happy about your first question also, that Kung Fu, I mean, in the 1970s, you know, is big, and actually it's really big um, today too, right? You have Jackie Chan, you know, who actually plays with the stereotype. And what I love about, you know, the Korean nurses' narratives, their children, I mean, their grandchildren, actually, who are, you know, second or third generation Korean German, they learn Kung Fu, right? So, so it's actually a very messy, but very interesting combination, like you're saying, of spaces that are opened up. You know, and these are spaces, even in the 1930s, there's a sense of grudging respect, you know, for hardworking, even Charlie Chan. I mean, so it's still stereotypical, but it's an opening for interaction. Yeah. Thanks so much. There was one question in the middle. I think Martin, Victor, yeah. Yeah. What are you comfortable with, I would say? Thanks. Oh, thanks. Can you hear me? Oh, thanks, Professor Banerjee, for a great uh, keynote first and foremost, and then I have two small questions. Uh, well, I don't know, the first one is small. Um, um, I'll start with the larger one. How does the archive continue? Um, I, I mean, how does the media presence and the visibility of Asian Germans maybe change in the 1990s or the early 2000s? Does it at all? Um, probably also dependent on genre and such. And then the small question, this sounds weird, but I'm very interested in Schwester Inge, or at least uh, in the... <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know if I want to phrase it like that, but the Schwest, is it Schwester Inge or Schwester Inge scene anyways, where um, she self-confesses that, that you know Moon isn't as passionate as her, right? And then there's this weird zoom on the two nurses giggling in the back, right? And I was wondering, is this a foreshadowing or meta-commentary, or is this in response to the self-description? So what do you make of that? I found this so eerie, that because the camera really takes that up, that giggling in the back. Right. So that's it. Yeah, I mean, I love the question. I mean, so, so now I'm so sort of worked up with Schwester Inge that your tell me your first question again. Just a hint. <laughs> ah, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, so I'm very grateful. So of course I'm obsessed with detective shows and Asian characters. So um, you know, in contemporary representations, there are Asian characters. Okay, in I can you know in in this weird kinds of shows, even in Wilsberg and all these other you know, shows. But the thing is, what is interesting about Germany, Germany skips the hyphenation and turns them into German women. So they're called Frau Müller, Frau Schmidt, right? So their ethnicity, I mean, they're not caricatured in a stereotypical way, or not in the old stereotypical way. They just skip all the ethnicization. So there's no Asian German even there. But now they're Frau Schmidt, and they look Asian, but nobody comments on that, right? So nobody comments on race. But what they're doing, even though it's completely out of character, they all do Kung Fu. And, and they're the dragon ladies, right? So the stereotypes are there. I mean, so, so sadly, because I thought it was, it was, you know, a revolution, you know, now they appear. But still the stereotypes linger. So that's something that I'm disturbed um, by. And so the, I love what you said about the, the nurses giggling and, and the uh, Schwester Inge. And I think, though, you know, everybody makes fun of Schwester Inge, you know, because she's so, I mean, she's more of a teenager, right? And, and, and they giggle and they make fun of her. But at the same time, I think that she is framed as passionate. Right? So this is more, you know, we laugh at her because she's kind of, you know, überzeichnet, right? She's sort of over the top, but we still sympathize with her. And she's human to us, I think, in a way that Moon never is. Um, yes. Okay. Uh, we have a couple more questions in here, but if you're okay, I would, because there's also a question in the chat. Okay. So um, I read it out. I realize my eyes are really bad, so I'm sorry if I'm... <laughs> Uh, it's by Kirsten Schwellberg. 
thank you for this talk. When I wanted to publish my PhD on Korean American self -represent representations, it is written in German. Two German university presses turned it down, telling me the topic was too exotic. On a different note, I could not have worked on Teresa Cha and other writers uh, without the help of Korean Germans, the largest Asian group in West Germany, by the way, who introduced me to the community in Berlin. Most, if not all, the people I've met then were either the children of Korean, uh, the children of Korean nurses uh, of adoptees, another group to consider. Some of them have been engaged in installing the Statue of Peace in Berlin to commemorate Korean women who were forced into prostitution by the Japanese during World War II, and the Japanese government um, has intervened. I refer to the late 1990s here uh, when I was working on my PhD. So I think it's more of a yeah. comment. <laughs> and and I'll just I'll just briefly comment. I'm so happy, Kirsten. I mean, who can probably hear me? See yes. Me? Yes. I'm so you would be the. I mean, I'm I'm just really so happy because I think your work. I mean, so I guess I would love to be in in conversation with you because all of what you said is so true. You know, Korean adoptee stories. I mean, very very complex chapter, also about racialization. <laughs> ha, Kirsten. <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh, I can. Okay, yes, so I, I can't, okay, yeah, that's fine. Oh, look, I can see her. Yeah, here. <laughs> I can see, see me too. See me too. Oh. Yeah, I'm just really happy because I, I think, you know, what, what I also really like about your comment is that how do we, in, in American studies, in the larger framework of American studies, how do we conceive of Korean American studies, right? I mean, how narrow would it be? How much would it say about Asian American studies, but also American studies at large? Um, so I, I guess I'm very much, uh, you know, I take your point because actually I read the story in terms of Asian American studies, but we could also read it specifically in terms of Korean American studies, right? With, with all the different narratives, you know, including Chang Rae Lee, I mean, there's a whole conversation, I think, between Doc, Haya, uh, Doc Hata in uh, A Gesture Life uh, as, as somebody from the military who talks about comfort women, you know, in Korean history. So, so I very much, uh, you know, would like to keep in touch about this. Thank you. Next question is by Eva Bismarck. <gasps> Eva. Um, first of all, uh, thank you so much, Mita, for that great talk. Um, I have a, a little comment that relates to Andreas Etke's um, issue. So, of course, this is intersectional. So it could have been a woman of a different class, but the nurses are also positioned as working class, right? It would be a much different story if we were talking about, like, wealthy Asian uh, identified women. So class and, and race very much um, intersect at this point. And um, the, the question I have is fairly broad, and it's not just for Mita, it's actually for all of us. So what could a space look like that would have recognized Moon's life? And what can that look like now? And not only like in Germany at large, but what could this look like at the DGFR? And I think, you know, this is, it's, you know, I cannot expect Mita to answer that, right? Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's also a question for all of us, and this is something that would be good to think about later um, during this um, conference also. Thanks. Am I answering? You. I'm not answering, right? But I think it's a great question. And I, I think I also, if I can, I would say that actually Corientation has a storytelling project about Asian, German people, young people, uh, living in Eastern Germany, right? So I think storytelling, different archives, you know, this would be a great project, for instance, right? So for instance, we could have a workshop, you know, w jointly with Corientation, um, you know, and, and yes. yes. Sorry. Okay. Next is uh, Sabine Zilke. Thank you very much, Mita, for a talk that uh, presented both your labor and your life. <laughs> so, um, and uh, my question relates uh, a little bit to what Eva Bösenberg just said, uh, because I'm wondering whether we cannot take matters uh, a step further. Uh, you presented the different kind of discourses uh, as dominant versus counter narratives. And I wonder whether we could not deconstruct that binarism because in many ways they are the same narratives because they uh, they uh, 
an, a firm of a division between uh, German and Korean and other others, right? Asians in, in general. S and, and the common ground we actually have is labor, not lives, right? And, and we should probably look closer at labor, and this would right. bring in your new sort of perspective or framework, right. because it is about uh, these, these uh, women are uh, engaged in, in professions that are not very well paid, as yes. we know. And so there may be a common ground of class, and I'm not arguing that class is over, yes. should over-determine ethnic yes. matters, but um, that would also mean to deconstruct that division that we're, we're discussing in our field, and I, I wonder what that actually would mean to our field if we don't sort of separate, you know, these different ethnic groups and discuss right. their lives, because their lives are of interest to some degree, but the matters that, that matter here yeah. are economic matters. Right. And uh, so what, what we actually need to encourage is, is, uh, is an inter-ethnic um, uh, alliance right. over these issues, right? And not over lives and food and blah, 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 which is right. fine, right? right. Uh, so I wonder whether you would not necessarily have to take your narrative further or right. the story or the matters further. Yes, I mean, it's a great, a great point. And I, I very much agree. I mean, so I guess I was saying, I would say, I mean, personally, I would need both. The thing is that I, I want to talk, I want to also be, I mean, I have to first, personally, but also as a scholar, you know, talk about, racialization and Asian German, okay? And so you're right though, in, in that moment, I'm replicating sort of a divide. But if I don't address that, I'm sort of not addressing the divide that is being made, I think, by sort of dominant discourses. So I have to say that. But then I would, I would very much agree with you that that's just one lens, right? And I think one of the projects that I would like to do is about care work. Um, and how at the intersection of, you know, as Eva also said, of, of you know, how the Pflege, I mean, the Pflege in Deutschland, you know, that's a whole discourse, right? And actually that would include, you know, aspects of class, also Eastern European. I have an aging project, right, that looks at care work for, for elderly uh, or for older people. Um, and, you know, there was a great project actually in, I think done in Berlin uh, about Polish nurses who take care of, you know, just, you know, older parents, right? And how that is a precarious work situation. So I think your, your point is really well taken that, you know, actually because, and, and you're also right in that if I, if I just sort of, I, I wouldn't sort of dismiss race, but if I focus on that other space, you know, there's so many more intersections, right? I mean, because otherwise I'm replicating the divide. I mean, so I very much, you know, I think all these projects could be in conversation with each other. So I'm not really suggesting um, that this is the only way. So I'm actually really interested in, I think also in the DGFA, that, you know, precarity, you know, has been a topic, right? Also at DGFA conferences. And I think this is where, you know, I would sort of love to also sort of engage in, right? So. What would it mean for our field? Ha! Huh. Yes, I would say, okay, I would say, uh, just talking for myself, I would say I want to do all these things at the same time. I'm interested in how ethnic studies intersect with precarity studies, intersect with medical humanities, because that's where racialized care work would come in, intersect with gender studies. So I think, obviously that's not very practicable, but I'm interested in how, and I don't have a mathematical mind, but how all these fields would connect, right? And that's what I love about American studies and the DGFA. You know, that, you know there could be a panel to each, uh, about each of these, but also there could be an intersecting panel about lives in medical care or lives in nursing. Um, and that would be gender studies, would be class, and it will, would, of course, be life writing. Um, yeah. Okay, there are two more questions, one in the middle, yes? Um, thank you so much for this really touching and empowering keynote. And it really resonated with me in terms of life building and achievement as someone who came from Turkey to Germany to pursue American studies. But also, as you said, we don't have a name tag that says, um, for example, I have absolutely no history of guest working in my family. So like my entire family and the people with whom I spent the majority of my life with um, are in Turkey. And, um, but like the moment I 
came to Germany, this whole history of guest working suddenly became relevant to me because I'm also Turkish, and, uh, but my career is American studies, so I really found myself thinking about Turkish-American studies recently, and my question is, could we imagine exactly the opposite as well? So inventing, for example, Turkish-American studies through Turkish-German studies, and, um, <laughs> or um, could we imagine, um, you know, <laughs> could we imagine Asian American studies also in terms of German Asian studies? So yeah. your research, I feel like your research does so much for American studies as much as it does for uh, German studies. And yeah, thank you. <laughs> I'm so happy. I think, you know, I, that sort of made my life. I mean, that question, I'm sorry. Because uh, that's what I, I mean, I, I love your question also because I think all these fields are in conversation with each other. So I've been, you know, originally, you know, I, when I first um, wrote this early paper about Asian German studies, it got taken up by German studies in the US. And so German studies, you know, is an entirely different field. So I'm, I want to be, and, and then people, of course, have told me many times that maybe I'm not really an Americanist, because this is not what American studies, I mean, at what point do we sort of overstretch the boundary? But I, I, I guess I love how all the, these fields are in conversation with each other. So I've been learning Turkish. I've been sort of reading Turkish-German literature, also because the class dimension is really strong. Um, and I work on Elif Shafak um, because about democracy and gender. Um, so I think, you know, maybe because we, we, we're saying we live in a transnational world. But so that means that all of these, we, what if we focus on the work we want to do and they could be homed or housed in different disciplines. So, you know, I've talked to Yuji Lee in Korean studies. Um, so what you're saying about Turkey, I think it's wonderful and you have to do it. Uh, I think it's wonderful also because you speak different languages, right? There's different archives, it's about class. Uh, but also I love your, the way you framed it is life writing in itself, right? How, for instance, once I had a job offer in the UK and I didn't go because all of, all of a sudden I had this colonial history as an Indian German, I mean, right? And I didn't, it was too much to take on. So I said, you know, <laughs> and also because Germany is my home. So I guess I'm really saying, uh, that's wonderful. So you, there needs to be a Turkish American, Turkish German studies. And you need to do it. <laughs> There's one question up there. Yes, I think it's Philip Gassard. Yeah. Thank you, Mita, for your wonderful talk. And um, I immensely enjoyed it. And also thank you for putting yourself out there in these various um, roles that you have to play in our association. I, since we are a scholarly association, I want to make two critical remarks as a historian. Um, <laughs> and that goes to archives and maps. And you know, I'm sure you know this, um, but I think uh, the archive needs to be a little bit uh, deeper than going back to the 50s and 1960s. Um, and uh, the insidiousness of the guest worker program, I think the real insidiousness of that program is not that we are talking about guest workers because that is what the Turkish government was doing, what the German government was doing, what everyone was doing, but that it, um, that it uh, made us overlook that Germany has been a society of immigrants from the 19, uh, 19th century on. Yeah? So it's a long story and it builds up on earlier such um, guest worker um, programs that already existed during the 1920s and the 1930s. Um, and that brings me to my second point, how does American studies inform German studies and vice versa? Um, and here I think the why is there no civil rights movement in Germany? You know, that question really got me thinking because I think the civil rights movement is a very American concept because it is related to a particular legal and constitutional framework, you know. Whereas in Germany, if you look for immigrant activism, you would have to look somewhere else. For example, the Polish labor movement um, in, of the 1920s and 1930s. Um, so that's not a civil rights movement in that sense, but it is more built on working class organizations. The same goes for the 1970s when you have a guest worker um, strikes, that's how it was called at the time, you know, where they actually um, also put out you know, their demands and um, how they are treated in factories as people who have no German citizenship. So 
I think there is no civil rights movement, yes, um, but there are other movements and protest movements that are based on immigrants. And so, again, you know, the methodological point is, yes, we can use American studies to um, illuminate German uh, society and history, um, but uh, we do not always find the same terms and concepts in, in our country here, here in Germany. So that's just two critical yes. comments I have. Yeah. Thank you I mean, for your talk again. So, so I'll take the easy way out. I'll say that I, I would love, I mean, you're, you're completely right, and that's why I would, my project would have to be in conversation, not just with historians, but with, you know, historians in American studies like you, right? Because I think, you know, it, the, the whole project will fall short if I just superimpose American terms on the German context. And I'm actually interested in that dialogue, right? And actually the Polish, I mean, actually Polish work migration for many different reasons would be really interesting to look at, also in terms of race, but also in terms of language and class. Um, and, and there was other things that I forgot that I wanted to say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, yeah. <laughs> but I very much agree. And I'll talk to you later. And because uh, I, I think, you know, also about the, the deep mapping, you know, that's Shelley's term. But also, she's, you know, she's a literary studies scholar, right? And she's very much aware, and she's doing this in conversation with historians, right? Um, so I think I'm really interested in, through the lens of American studies, what do we see that otherwise we wouldn't have seen? But also, if we have the German history lens, what do we see then, right? And actually, eventually, how can that also inform our looking back to the US, right? Like you're saying, do we see the civil rights movement in, in different terms? when we look through German-Americanist eyes, right? So I think, you know, I, I very much take your point. Okay, if I'm not mistaken, there's one last question up there by Rebecca Bruckmann. One more? more of a comment, but I'll try to keep it short. Thank you very much for your wonderful talk, Mita. I just wanted to very briefly say that I kind of f find it important what you're doing, and that is looking at intersectionality because of the link between class and racialization. Because I kind of got the impression here that the impetus is to kind of shove racialization aside and basically say this is a class issue, but particularly if you look at care work, that is very much racialized. Um, so I think this is an important thing to do, and I just to, to echo what um, Philip Gassat has said, I think it's also important to look at the longer history of immigration, also the idea of German citizenship as being based on bloodlines until the end of the 20th century, and how that links to the history of German colonialism and immigration in the early 20th century. And I think there's an important link here, although I would argue that there is a different logic to anti-black racism than there is to anti-Asian racism, but you talked about model minority, so you know, I'm not telling you anything new here. So thank you. And if I can, you know, that just, I want to enlist, I want to sort of sign up in your tutorial, that, you know, both in yours and Philip's, uh, because, um, you know, and there was a whole section of the paper uh, that actually, Oh, I'm so sorry, I just forgot. I'm sorry, Mita, to interrupt you, just to say, when you think of civil rights movement in, in, in Germany, I would look into like Afro-German activism in the 1980s, because there certainly is a transnational tradition. I would say that there's also the idea that echoes very much the civil rights movement or the black freedom struggle, to you know, call it what it actually is. Um, very much. Right, right. Okay. Yes. Okay, so I see there's an ongoing project that I want to be part of. And, you know, also, you know, I very much make the point. So what I didn't want to say, I mean, I think officially it wasn't called the civil rights movement, right? But what I'm saying is that kind of official discourse would actually marginalize, would, would actually fail to look at, you know, black German movements. I mean, because these were very much there. And also I, I'm very happy about uh, Rebecca's point about race. Because I think when I conflated, and I had a whole section that elaborated on that, that racialization works very differently. For instance, you know, for black German women and for Asian German women, right? Because the stereotypes are different, right? So I didn't mean to conflate it. It was just a critique of whiteness. But I'm just, I'm just so happy because I learned so much, and I want to be part of all your projects. We're not done yet. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, I missed uh, one question uh, earlier on. Um, I, th I think it's, oh, even two. Um, so maybe we can keep it short because there's something waiting us for us um, okay, outside. Okay, I'll keep it short. Thanks for addressing okay. this topic. Um, that's 
absolutely important and very amazing. I have a question that relates to something that Martin said, and that's related to um, narrative and media. Uh, I should preface this, I know next to nothing about German popular culture, I don't watch Tartort, I don't know that stuff. Is that, how is that, to me, it's really bad script writing. Um, how is that related to um, the particular medium of this sort of four, 20 Uhr, 60 minute, 90 minute um, script writing and, um, and the particular format and medium? Actually, that's a great question. And I want to be in conversation with people from media studies. It, I actually, you know, there's all kinds. Mean, so I've actually, um, I talked to a colleague in, here in Tübingen who's in journalism, and she also mentioned sort of media specificity. So, so I would very much, you know, agree with you in the sense that we need to look at different media formats. But this would be prime time. I mean, some of them would be four acht, right? Uh, so that's obviously, you know, I, I, wanted, I don't want to say sort of trash TV, but, you know, obviously it's not as, but that says a lot about me, right? So the thing is that I'm actually interested in what, the, for all the differences in media, what overlaps there are. Right? So other discourses would have a more sophisticated way of saying these things, right? But I want to trace a certain, you know, like the guest worker myth, sort of insidious questions about citizenship was mentioned, right? Um, you know, what kind of belonging do we actually imagine? And so I guess I, I would very much agree with you because I would like to trace the same moment in sophisticated media, whatever they would be, and in popular culture, and how, because that's how we could sort of think about what is common, and what, as you're saying, is really a trap of the medium, right? So, so that would be my proof, and, and I'm, I'm sort of convinced that I would be able to find it, but, but I'll check. Okay, there was one more question, but I got a signal from the organizers that um, I have to cut off the session now, so maybe we... So, okay, go ahead. Thank, thank you. Um, thank you for this amazing talk. I was constantly thinking about this documentary from 2009. I don't know if you know it, Endstation der Sehnsüchte. Um, that's also about three Korean women going back after retirement, taking their husbands. And what they all had in common is that their husbands were completely unwilling to learn the language. And that everyone around them was so frustrated, saying, you know, this is so disrespectful to their wives and to everyone around. And I was wondering if this is something that you came across uh, during your research, this German unwillingness to communicate, not only to one another, but also communicate about the lives of these people, as you said, for example, in the media. So, so you're saying, so these were German husbands who refused to learn Korean? Yes. Oh, yeah. Yes. I mean, so actually, and, 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 and this goes back to Zabine Zirke, because, you know, she said that to make my story more complicated, which it is, because actually you have both, so... This is gender care work, right? So they were working incredibly long hours, and the, most of the nurses were married and had children, but their husbands, both white German husbands and Korean husbands, actually had a very, I mean, this is like 1970s, right? Traditional patriarchal role. So that meant they would work night shifts, and then they would spend the day with their families, you know, and the, 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 their partners would not take care of the children, right? So, so that was a role conflict. Um, and, and you, you know, it was incredible. And actually, the, now there's interviews with the children saying, I don't know how, how my mother would have survived this, right? So I think there was a lack of communication, you know, on multiple, you know, all, but also on multiple levels by multiple husbands. But also, you know, even the husbands then, and that makes me sort of furious, wouldn't acknowledge the work. You know, they wanted the life, actually. But said, you know, if you, and, and a lot of the Korean husbands came to Germany with their wives and w weren't working. But they also weren't take, taking care of the children, some of them. So, but this is where gender roles would actually intersect in very complicated ways. Um, so I'm, I'll look more into that. Thank you. Okay, I hope I didn't forget anyone. Um, I have one more announcement to make, but first of all, um, thank you, Mita, for this wonderful. <laughs> So now I was asked to announce the following 
good news. <laughs> uh, Winter Verlag invites us to a brunch, including, as you probably heard, uh, sparkling wine or champagne outside, to, um, among other things, uh, to celebrate the relaunch of America Studien, American Studies. Um, so a big thank you uh, to uh, Dr. Barth and Frau um, Kunetzker from Winter Verlag um, and also, of course, to Birgit Davis and Carmen Birkler, who I can't see at the moment, for um, their incredible and wonderful work um, in, in relaunching uh, the journal and all the effort they put in there. So um, thank you and um, yeah, enjoy. <laughs>
I guess. All right, welcome back and welcome to this year's panel on current events in the hybrid format. I am Sid Legesi from the Collaborative Research Center on Law and Literature that is based at the Universities of Münster and Osnabrück. And it's my pleasure to moderate this panel on the relationship between scholarship and activism. That very term, activism, can be a broad and contested terrain in academia. Among other things, activism may be understood as a badge of pride that signals one's commitment to translating scholarly insights into concrete social action. However, having one's work called activist may also be experienced as wearing the scarlet letter A for activist, that may signal one's excommunication from specific academic circles. Yet in some disciplines, translating the theoretical into practical, practical action may be actually literally part of your job description. Even within the field of American studies in Germany, we emerge from sometimes diverging genealogies where subfields like disability studies or black studies or feminist studies have historically entered academia through activism. Recent debates on both sides of the Atlantic, and I'm thinking, among other things, of the controversy around critical race theory, these debates too ask about the political stakes of scholarship and higher education. To what, ex to what extent scholarship should or shouldn't perform political work and what that means for our larger democratic order. At stake is our very understanding of scholarship, especially now in the face of various global justice movements from Black Lives Matter to Fridays for Future. In our German Association for American Studies, we've had controversial debates about these topics and about whether activism and scholarship constitute or should constitute separate spheres. In today's panel, we're branching out and deepening this necessary and ongoing conversation with an international and interdisciplinary panel that I would like to introduce to our audience. Professor Gard is a Fulbright Scholar at Leuphana University in um, Lüneburg, and she's also a professor of English and Women, Gender, and Sexuality Studies at the University of Wisconsin River Falls. Her teaching and research explore conceptual and narrative intersections among feminism and climate justice, queer ecologies, and critical animal studies. She is a founding member of the Minnesota Green Party and has served the Association for the Study of Literature and Environment since its first, first conference in 93, both on the Executive Council and on the editorial board for the organization's journal, um, and that is called Interdisciplinary Studies in Literature and Environment. She is the author and editor of over 100 articles and uh, seven books of eco-criticism um, feminist practice. Her newest volume is called Contemplative Practices and Anti-Oppressive Pedagogies for Higher Education, and I hope we'll hear more about that today. Okay. <laughs> Our next panelist is Professor Agnieszka Graf, who is an associate professor at the American Studies Center at the University of Warsaw. She's a cultural studies scholar with research interests in gender studies, feminist history, and nationalism. Her articles have appeared, for instance, in the journal Science, East European Politics and Societies, Public Culture, and the European Journal of Women's Studies. She co-edited the science issue, Gender and the Rise of the Global Right, and I would like to draw your attention to um, her co-authored open access book, Anti-Gender Politics in the Populist Moment. She's a feminist activist and public intellectual, regular contributor to liberal and left-wing media outlets, and the author of four books of feminist essays in Polish, including World Without Women and Mother and Feminist. Mm -hmm. Our next panelist is Dorothy Marx, who many of us know as Do from the Diversity Roundtable. And she's a PhD candidate and lecturer in American Studies at Kiel University, where she also serves as a diversity and equality counselor. Her dissertation project is titled Bodies Irregular, 
and it examines the links between time, disability, and chronic illness in comics as well as novels. She has published on the, in, on the influence of toxic positivity on disability self-representation, the depiction of cystic fibrosis in particular, and her own positionality as a disabled scholar. She's the first recipient of the Martin Shuva Publication Award for Excellence in Comic Studies and was awarded the 2020 Sabin Award for Comic Scholarship by the International Graphics, Novels, and Comics Conference. I'm coming to our uh, last panelist of today's discussion, Tobias Maya, who has studied urban policy and regional planning at TU Berlin. And uh, Tobias Maya is a PhD candidate at the University of Göttingen. His research focuses on interreligious dynamics in community organizing in the cities of Berlin, Hamburg, Cologne, and Leipzig. Maya has been involved in numerous community projects across the country, and since 2013, he's the lead organizer of North Rhine-Westphalia for the DECO, um, and that's an abbreviation that stands for the German Institute for Community Organizing at the Catholic University of Applied Social Sciences in Berlin. So welcome to all our panelists online and offline. Each panelist has prepared a position paper on the relationship between scholarship and activism that will be read out and presented right now, and that will form the basis of um, our panel discussion, but that panel discussion will then be open to audience participation here in Tübingen and on Zoom halfway through. And if you have any questions and comments, please share them with us, either by raising your hand right here in Tübingen or by sending um, a comment or posting and comment in the Zoom chat. Thank you so much. Our, would, I would like to start with uh, Professor Gard. The floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, slides might make it seem longer, but it is really only two pages. Uh, it's an honor to be here with such uh, innovative scholars on this panel. I'm, I'm really eager to hear what other people have to say. So, um, in the United States, to say that's purely academic in public discourse is to impugn a statement as irrelevant. But in academic discourse, placing an idea in the realm of theory and abstraction is among the highest honors. That's our starting point. And that's the reason that Mark Edwards and his team at Virginia Tech were disciplined by the editor-in-chief of Hydrology's leading journal, Environmental Science and Technology. And here's how the events unfolded. In April 2014, the water manager for the city of Flint, Michigan, discontinued purchasing of treated water from the Detroit Water and Sewer Department and switched the Flint residents to a temporary water source, allegedly in preparation for switching to a different water authority in 2016. But in less than a year, children in the predominantly African-American community of Flint began to suffer. By January 2015, Flint residents were having health problems and health tests on Flint children revealed steadily elevating blood levels. I just want to show you a few resources. So you'll stop looking at me and look at the slides. There you go. Uh, based on these residents, this is Mark Edwards on, on the right. Based on these residents' experiences and the revelation that there was no corrosion control plan for the pipes from the temporary water source, Virginia Tech researchers implemented an intensive follow-up monitoring program, sending the residents of Flint plastic bottles for collecting the discolored water samples under normal use conditions and providing postage paid envelopes to return the samples. For funding, researcher Mark Edwards used his own resources and solicited contributions from others. There was no time to wait for support through the top-down funding channels. 
By April 2015, samples had been tested and confirmed as containing lead concentrations significantly above the Environmental Protection Agency's actionable level. Data from these water samples prompted a system-wide sampling of the water provided to Flint residents. Blood tests revealed spiking lead in the blood of Flint children citywide, and a state of emergency was declared by local, state, and federal health officials. Had they waited, the injustices of childhood lead poisoning, vital infrastructure damage, and one of the largest Legionnaires disease outbreaks in U.S. history would never have been uncovered. It worked so well when you did it, Katharina. I got it. Okay, thank you. So, defending their involvement in the Flint water crisis, Mark Edwards and Amy Pruden argue, Flint reminds us to open our eyes to injustice and our ears to the voices of the public. We must be prepared to exercise our academic freedom to advance the science needed to address urgent issues facing society today. And this article was published in Environmental Science and Technology. But a month after their editorial appeared, the journal's editor-in-chief responded, claiming that Edwards and the Virginia Tech team were, quote, crossing an imaginary line. When a scholar becomes enmeshed in an American-style media controversy, Researchers quickly become uneasy, wrote Sedlak. There are legitimate concerns about the implications of environmental activism in the research world because it undermines the standing of academics as objective seekers of truth. Instead, Sedlak advised, we researchers should protect ourselves and our institutions by seeking out non-governmental organizations that employ full-time activists to translate our research findings into action. In my interdisciplinary field of eco-criticism and the environmental humanities, this same dualism has been debated in our professional organization, ASLI. During the first two decades of its formation, uh, the highest prestige was awarded to those who created taxonomies of the field dividing what people were actually doing into categories, and once they were understood, the book was over. <laughs> the lowest status was accorded to those who wrote about teaching and pedagogies of active environmental justice. Second and third class status, respectively, were awarded to those who developed eco-critical theory, which was soon taxonomized by those who do that. And below that, those who provided close readings of a single text. Has anything really changed? Perhaps. Today, activist educators have gained some status. We write about socially engaged teaching. We require service learning components in our environmental literature courses. We bridge the body-mind experiences of climate change and environmental racism by practicing exercises that invite discussions, reconnecting our intellectual and affective responses, exploring our diversely situated histories of oppression and privilege so that authenticity and vitality flow into our learning, reading, writing, and actions alike. The article I provided to accompany my participation, is it available to people when we provide those articles or not? It is, okay. Um, uh, exemplifies the theory practice nexus. When COVID-19 sent universities online in early 2020, I began drafting a petition to my local and global colleagues, inviting them to review, amend, and potentially commit to the idea that we would practice what we teach. <laughs> we would become true allies with the systems of the earth and earth others that we teach about and those that support our lives. In collaboration with the editors of Bifrost Online, I co-authored an article called Through the Portal of COVID, Visioning the Environmental Humanities as a Community of Purpose and inviting our Environmental Humanities colleagues to use the pandemic as a portal into thinking in multi-generational terms and cohabiting within a multi-species world so that all our relations as Minnesotan and Ojibwe activist Winona LeDuc says, all our relations may not only survive, but flourish. Thank you.
I don't know how to. <laughs> Thank you so much for this wonderful position statement. And we'll be moving on to our next panelist, Professor Agnieszka Graf. Can you hear me? Can you see yes. me? Ah, I, there I am. Um, okay. I would like to start by saying thank you for having me here. Um, I've been uh, doing the uh, academia versus activism thing for some 20 years, and I rarely have the opportunity to reflect on what it means. Um, so I really am happy to be in this, uh, in this situation. I will start by reading the first paragraph of the book that was already so kindly uh, recommended. It is open access, but here's the, the cover. It's called anti-gender politics in the populist moment. And it's extremely relevant, especially the first paragraph. So here it is. In the fall of 2013, we, that is myself and my co-author, accepted an invitation to participate in what promised to be an interesting exchange, a discussion of gender organized at the Dominican church in Warsaw a place known for featuring progressive Catholic intellectuals and for fostering public debate. A few minutes into the discussion, however, a smoke bomb was deployed by a group of extremists gathered in the audience. They were several young men and they were holding up a sign. I couldn't believe what I saw it saying, gender equals 666. The, length, the, the number of the demon, I'm sure you are aware. Clearly, someone believed that demonic forces were in play, a thought we found quite amusing at the time. The church was promptly evacuated. The Dominican priests were shocked and apologetic. They said we should meet again soon, but ultimately no such invita invitation was extended. At the time, what was happening in Poland around women's rights and the concept of gender itself appeared exceptional or aberrant. We thought so too. Polish conservatism seemed somewhat extreme and slightly grotesque. Still, we believed that dialogue might be possible. After the incident, we understood it would not. The very word gender, previously a neutral sounding term used, and here's the connection to our present debate, used almost exclusively in academic contexts, um, was now becoming the center of a new phase of the culture wars. So this is the context. I am a feminist um, who uh, has uh, for many years uh, divided her life between academic life, where I did feminist theory, feminist history, um, women's studies, and um, uh, basically made sure that all sides were welcome, although, of course, most of my students tended to be those who were actually interested in feminism. Uh, and I, I tried to separate this part of my life from my activism, which was uh, actually in my earlier years um, quite flamboyant. I was the co-organizer of Poland's Manifa movement with street theater and so on. But there was a strict division between gender and feminism, and gender was the neutral term, whereas feminism was the volatile part that I was asked to kindly keep to myself when at the university. Well, following um, 2012, and possibly a little earlier than that, that became completely impossible. I was now demonized by the anti-gender movement as a genderist. And genderists, as you may know from campaigns that in the Germany are led by the AFD and also uh, the more conservative wing of the Catholic Church. In fact, one of the founders of the movement or the key intellectuals of the movement, Gabriel Kubi, is a German sociologist, completely unknown in Germany, by the way. Um, uh, so, so these campaigns have become global and uh, they have become violent. One of the most famous incidents concerned Judith Butler's uh, visit in, uh, in Brazil uh, in 2017. She was attacked and actually hurt and her effigy was burned. Um, so the idea that, ge that gender is a form of, um, is a demonic force is, is, not, um, is not just a Polish idea, definitely. So I found myself in a position where I couldn't separate my activism uh, from my engagement, from my academic engagement, and I became interested in theories that um, that actually talk about this. And I think 
my position on this issue in terms of theory is twofold. On the one hand, um, I share the perspectives uh, that in the uh, in American academia, I think originate um, uh, mostly in Foucauldian theorizations of power and knowledge, and that the whole idea that knowledge production is not politically neutral, and that pretending that it is is actually a political position. Um, and of course theories of positionality that are developed in feminist contexts and in uh, critical race theory and so on. And I teach these theories and I discuss them with my students. But on the other hand, I'm in, engaged in the Polish um, uh, struggles over how political academia should be. Um, I work, uh, just to state my position clearly, I work at the American Studies Center in Wars at Warsaw University, uh, where we get to develop our own curriculum, but we are also part of um, Polish academia. And just to give you a sense of what it feels like, the uh, Minister of Higher Education in Poland um, is an ultra conservative who uh, develops um, programs uh, for education where the word gender is to be banned. And the whole idea of politicization of, uh, of um, academic study is anathema. Uh, so I partake in the leftist part of Polish uh, academia, which links itself to older traditions of what we call engaged intellectual life or engaged intelligentsia. And this idea has its roots in pre-war Polish uh, socialist uh, intellectual life where the university was imagined as a cauldron where um, uh, ideas of a better society, of a better world um, are developed in, through debate, through conversation, through reading of literature and so on. Uh, but of course, this tradition is highly contested in, in Poland today um, because of the political climate. So what is my solution um, personally? And this is not a solution I would recommend to anyone. It's just what happens to have happened to me. And this first paragraph I read to you as an example is that I repositioned myself from the split personality, feminist here, gender studies scholar here, to a um, scholar of the culture wars. Um, I teach courses on American culture wars um, that are historical, uh, but also have a strong component concerning the so-called new culture wars. I've written a book about the global, um, I've co-written this book about the global um, anti-gender movement. And my interest now is tracing the connections between the American religious right and this global anti-gender movement, um, especially its Russian wing. Um, so the, the problem for me is that I find myself repeatedly in the position of being both, um, metaphorically speaking, the bird and the ornithologist in struggles over gender. So my strategy, um, and I don't know how far it will last, um, is to sort of move a little bit beyond this division and examine the struggles themselves. Teaching conflict, this is a slightly outdated term, but um, that's how I was educated in the States. And I think it's actually a useful strategy when teaching in this volatile political context. In other words, when I teach uh, the culture wars, I look at the dynamics of polarization and I expose students to both sides of the polarization. So we try to find tools for studying the American religious right uh, with the motto, um, analyze, don't moralize. In other words, we don't hide our positions. Um, and I do get ultra conservatives in my classes, by the way. Um, uh, but the, the, the aim of the exercise um, is not to be on the right side, but rather to be on the side that understands both sides' positions and the dynamic of polarization itself. Thank you. Thanks so much for this rich contribution. Um, our next panelist is uh, Dorothy. Take it away. Thank you, Cedric. Thank you so much for, um, for allowing me to be here. I'm, um, I'm really honored to be able to appear in this uh, wonderful setup of scholars. So as a white cis woman living with a disability or a disabling yet primarily invisible chronic illness, whose work in American studies is rooted in disability studies, the scholarly work that I do is always informed by my personal experience of living with a disability. By making the decision to actively disclose my disability, I am already performing activist work in this very moment. When I choose to link the personal to my work as a scholar, I am quite openly making the personal public 
and thereby political. Through repeated disclosures, I join an ongoing conversation that touches upon questions of positionality, but also the role of knowledges and privileges. Navigating academia while negotiating a disabled identity can be a precarious undertaking, particularly for contingent faculty and for scholars who are marginalized on multiple levels. Here I am aware of the white privilege that plays into my ability to openly address my chronic illness. For many others, disclosure can only happen in liminal spaces, in the hallways, but not in a lecture hall or in emails uh, sent secretly to myself after, um, after I have yet again spoken about disability in public. When disclosing their conditions, invisibly disabled researchers risk stigmatization and their invisible disabilities may be, as uh, Brown writes, dismissed as a fabrication, malingering and the act of a fundamentally lazy or overwhelmed worker seeking validation. So the repeated acts of what Heather Dunn Evans has called uncovering that I perform every time that I disclose my disability, be it in a town hall, a publication, or on this panel, may yet have repercussions for me in my career. Nevertheless, I also believe that it is necessary to gently but firmly remind us that academia has yet to acknowledge that disabled people are no longer just research objects, but in fact have long become researchers in their own right, despite the barriers that they face. These barriers, as for example, JT Dormich discusses, do not only pertain to architectural barriers, which make ac accessing university buildings difficult when the elevator is broken yet again, but they also relate to the fact that, and I quote, academia powerfully mandates able-bodiedness and able-mindedness, as well as other forms of social and communicative hyperability, which seems to exclude disability by default. Uh, however, I would go one step further and argue that the lack of space for stories of disability and the framing of revelations of disabilities as narcissistic taboo excretions, as Janet MacArthur writes, is linked to a general avoidance of emotion <clears throat> of the personal or emotional in academia. Uh, Margaret Price links academia's avoidance of emotion directly to disability avoidance and the, quote, desire to protect academic discourse as a rational realm, a place where emotion does not intrude. I have uh, previously in a publication called my approach to uh, American studies affected scholarship. And for me, this means that my work uh, as a teacher and as a lecturer and as a, as a researcher is um, <clears throat> sorry, centered on questions of intersectional disability representation and visibility, both on an analytical level of examining literature and culture, but also on a material level by trying to help raise awareness of and alleviate some of the barriers disabled people face in the academy. Disability is a field, or disability studies is a field that has historically struggled to include the voices of people of color, and I try to be aware of my white privilege in my work. Despite the unease with which German academia views engaged scholarship and personalized research, I believe firmly that it remains vital to examine our emotional investments into our work. Alison Kaver, for example, suggests that we pay attention not only to the way that having a disabled body informs our work, but that we also question how the implicit tab taboo to include mental and emotional distress into disability studies influences the field and by extension also other fields that work with the tools of disability studies. Um, I believe that my approach does not limit, obstruct, or contort the work that I do, but I'm convinced that what David Bolt has called experiential knowledge of disability and paying attention to our emotional investments can enhance scholarship by offering new vantage points to deconstruct ableist binaries and then an analysis of literature and culture and in higher education as a whole. Um, I think I wanna add that in the ongoing pandemic, I think this work um, has not become less important. Thank you. Thank you. And last but not least, I would like to welcome Tobias Meyer to 
uh, this panel discussion and our conference, because you're not a classically trained Americanist, as I understand. Uh, and I very much look forward to your take on the relationship um, between activism and scholarship. Well, thank you for inviting me. Um, I, I'm, I was always thinking when I he listened to the other um, people uh, f right before me, how I introduced myself. And I would maybe say I'm the activist here in a way. So I am, I'm a community organizer for several years now doing community organizing in the drum branch of uh, the Industrial Aeros Foundation, going back to the work of Solodinsky. Um, so we have a transatlantic background of the work we are doing here and working with a lot of the uh, US American traditions in democratic um, work in the local neighborhood. So mostly uh, convened by Leo Penta, who is a, was a professor at the University of Applied Science in Berlin, just retired uh, this year. Um, looking back at the traditions of organizing shows the, the the tension in between scholarship and activism in a in a in a in a good 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 way because Solodinsky, when he developed organizing, was a trained sociologist out of the Chicago School of Sociology in Chicago, and he kind of dropped out saying that sociology does not help with solving problems that the industrial city of the Euro American uh, beginning 20th century um, had, and kind of was very ag aggressive against um, science and doing research uh, on people instead of doing something with the people. And that's something that consists in doing organizing until today. But I want to point out three things that developed over the year in connecting scholarship and local activism um, around organizing. The first point is, and thanks for uh, Greta Gard, showed the, the perfect example for that in providing the data and the uh, um, good analysis of the situations on the local level, what should be changed um, in cities or more in society. And that's where we as an NGO could step in. And thank you for, for addressing that. That's our part that organizing can connect scholarship with activism. And that there are some examples even happening in Germany here and most in, in the US context of organizing, for example, a living wage was developed in Baltimore with the help of scholars um, doing the data um, to really measure the right amount of um, of, the, of wage for living, living in a city like Baltimore. So that's the, the first point. The second one is that uh, the, the, the fundamental, the basis of local engagement should be best well informed by academic research and thoughts of political engagement that could that is until today drawn by academic research and some of the political and uh, thinkers and theologists out of academia that were used today. So um, even Alinsky, if he declined uh, working with academia in a close sense, used some of the research results and some of the thoughts that were developed in academia for his um, work and teaching the people the um, right way of being democratic and getting engaged with each other. So that's the second point. So uh, academia could help the local activists in rethinking the broader picture in a way. So, And then and there's some tension in that with that. Maybe we can discuss that later in having the perception of the local level and academia. And the third point, and that's the paper I propose, is also something that universities and University of Applied Science could uh, work really good with this tension between academia and local activism as an institution, because they are institutions of education that could, and thank you for Agnieszka Graf for showing it with her example, um, bringing together activists um, and scholars, um, helping students develop a broader view of what's happening outside of research, and also getting the activists elements of students in contact with research. And that's um, maybe maybe some of the points we can discuss later, that um, academia and scholarship, not only as people, as individual people, but as an institution, could also help fostering a new connection in between activism and research. And we can see that in the German situation of uh, community organizing uh, pretty clearly because in every organization we are working now, a community organization 
some connections on there to the University of Applied Science, mostly to, so to social sciences, but it uh, could be something else um, um, in, in reintegrating scholarship and activism. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for all these rich contributions. It's quite a challenge to bring those contributions together. We've talked about equal uh, critical justice. We've raised the issue of disability in academia. We've talked about organizing. We've talked about the global stakes of feminist studies and feminist scholarship. But I can already see a range of ties connecting these individual contributions in implicit but also explicit ways. And I would like to stay with Tobias for a second before we jump into the conversation. I have a very basic question for all the participants. How do you define activist scholarship or engaged scholarship in a nutshell with like <laughs> everyday words? Um, if you could share well, a brief uh, thesis uh, statement, uh, because uh, I know you've worked on the concept of the outside in university. Right, and so I'll be really interested as a point of departure, so know, so we know what we're talking about when we use a term like activism or activist scholarship. Um, I think that would be helpful for the remainder well, well, of our discussion. In, 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 in relying to, to Goethe, I would say that's a Gretchen frage. Mm -hmm. um, so we can talk about that for a long time. Um, as an organizer, activists are mostly seen as the bad ones because they are activistic in a way and not building long-time relations um, within the community. So it's more around an issue-based um, um, campaigning. But I think that's not a broader picture. That's something that's mostly discussed on practice of organizing. I would m m see it more like Michael Borrowey uh, sketched it in his term of public sociology, and I'm working with his uh, extended case study in my PhD, um, that there are certain um, certain um, roles of um, scholars uh, that you can propose, especially he looked at sociology in um, uh, having uh, certain data uh, to change um, issues um, or um, developing the field um, forward. So there are four types of sociologists that could be there. And looking at a public sociologist, um, that's someone who's eager to engage also with the practice and being kind of the field as well. And I would uh, see that as, uh, as well for research as well and, and more, even, even more strongly for teaching that uh, being a scholar is in a way also an activist in, I don't know, framing the world view of the students. So that's something that I think is really activistic if it's done in a good way. How do you, thanks, how do you feel about Tobias' statement? Can you relate? Yeah, I, I see things a little differently, but mm -hmm. yeah, I appreciate his standpoint. Yeah. Um, because I know you have this track record of connecting scholarship to act activist question, and I'm also wondering for myself, for our institution, for our discipline, what it means to perform work that can be received as activists when the job description didn't clearly state we're, we're hiring you to perform activist political work, but you're hired by an English department. What does that mean? Uh, the question is very different pre and post tenure. Mm -hmm, okay. <laughs> Could you elaborate on that? That sounds uh, very promising. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, pre-tenure, of course, you, you need to prove that you can do what the position description has called for, and there's, there's no debate about that. Um, uh, Post-tenure, you can branch out um, and do both. Uh, you were hired to do a particular thing, and you need to continue doing that thing, but you can also augment it, and you can also develop other things that you do. And whether you include those other things on your resume or not, depends on the visibility that they have by others in your field. So again, it's building allies so that, that you can take this back to your department and say there's legitimacy in my field for the kind of work that I'm doing and it would bring more visibility to our department to continue and support this work. Yes. Thank you so much. 
Um, perhaps I would like to combine the question of activist or scholarship in general with uh, a pre-tenure perspective, Dool, if you would like to jump in. <laughs> <laughs> but no pressure. Uh, no, never. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, um, it is, I'm, I'm thinking back to, to the first time um, I wrote this um, article on affected scholarship, and I think I needed about the first seven or eight pages before I actually started doing my analysis to kind of justify the <laughs> justify the kind of work that I was doing and to to kind of um, kind of explain that okay, well, I'm <laughs> hi, I'm doing disability studies, but it's American studies and comics. And also I'm gonna write about um, a chronic illness that I have and that I live with myself. And this is fine because, and then, then, I, then I, it, I took a few pages to, um, to make sure that this, this article wasn't some form of um, um, uh, end of my career, you know, before it had even started. Um, <clears throat> so um, I think I've said this before in, in, my, in my statement that there, that, um, um, I think it, it, there are a lot of sort of different pr privileges that play um, into the ability to do activist work to um, the class background that you come from. The, um, is, there sort of a, is there a financial fallback for me if I really uh, sort of activ <laughs> um, activize myself out of academia? Um, or um, am I a white person? Am I... Um, Am I, am I cis? Am I um, sort of performing uh, my whiteness, my femininity um, correctly? Um, so, uh, I mean, I, I, <laughs> I can't really give a career advice because I haven't, <laughs> haven't yet figured out <laughs> whether or not I'm going to get a job next year. I'm going to be in the market, folks. Um, <laughs> so, uh, it's... Um, <clears throat> Um, it's it's a balancing act, um, and I think it's more what I'm doing is more common in disability studies, which is a more established field in the states than it is here. Um, but um, I'm gonna guess I'm gonna continue activisting for a bit longer and see where that uh, where that takes me. Thanks. I saw an interesting connection between your contribution and the contribution by Professor Graf, and that was um, emotions or affect, different forms of affect, because usually there is a connotation or there can be a connotation of irrationality or a distance to scientific objectivity when work is explicitly framed as or received as activist, right? And Professor Graf um, raised the issue of creating empathy, I guess, in the classroom. And I was wondering if you could elaborate on the, the affective stakes in higher education and your scholarship. And I know that in disability studies, disability studies itself has a vexed relationship to um, different forms of affect and what kind of role affect and display of emotions should play in the field. Mm. <laughs> Thank you for that question. Um, there is a there is a wonderful special issue on uh, from the Journal of Literary and Cultural Disability Studies um, by um, Elizabeth Donaldson um, uh, and a co-author whose name I can't come up with at this point. Um, who's um, that starts with the with the heading? There is no crying in disability studies. Um, they. Um, um, the two authors very much um, take apart this notion that disability studies, and it's, uh, as you said, uh, is a field that has um, examined the, the role of affect uh, in, in a lot of detail. And um, because part of um, the disability rights movement um, was, of course, this idea to um, to get away from this from these different emotional depictions of disability. So depicting disability as a tragedy um, or as inspiring um, the um, kind of metaphors and tropes that, that, are, that still exist, that are still around. Um, <clears throat> and um, I think that, that um, what the two, these two scholars are arguing is that, that the um, Catherine Prendergast is the second um, author. And what Donaldson and Prendergast are arguing basically is the idea that 
um, <clears throat> disability studies has been so concerned with getting out of this, this tragedy representation that um, the field has has moved has has kind of moved away from also um, taking into account pain or emotional distress and um, so that when um, that on the one hand it is common to to disclose your disability at the beginning of an article or to kind of make your positionality with regard to disability clear so do you have a disability do you have a disabled um, per, uh, family member or spouse for example um, but that this um, that, that it has become kind of a difficulty and taboo to talk about situations in which um, you cannot perform this idea of desiring disability. Um, <clears throat> and um, so I'm, um, I'm, I think I'm very intrigued by this, um, by this idea that, um, that I mentioned earlier, um, that um, we pay attention to these emotional investments and we look at, um, um, are there, um, what, is, what is sort of taboo? Am I allowed to talk about, uh, to do disability studies and for example, talk about the fact that um, uh, there are days where, um, where I'm not uh, very happy about having to live with a uh, chronic illness. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> and um, at the same uh, time also looking and especially in the, in the context of the, of the pandemic, um, looking closer at the idea of, um, of trauma and the, um, I think the, tra the, the collective trauma that disabled people have been experiencing for the last two years um, in the sense that um, their lives have been marked very clearly and very publicly as expendable in this pandemic. Um, I hope this answers part of the question. I think I went off into a little <laughs> deep disability studies trajectory here. Sorry. Well, thanks for laying out a specific genealogy of disability studies. I would like to move on to Professor Graf because you've mentioned an interesting take on feminist studies in the classroom and you were talking about a concept of creating empathy rather than critique, uh, but uh, perhaps I misunderstood you there. Uh, perhaps, perhaps you could elaborate on that. I know that everybody talks about affect these last 10 years, but I want to backtrack a little bit to the concept of ideology versus neutrality. Um, this may seem theoretically outdated, but it's highly relevant in the context of right-wing populism, uh, which is actually the context in which we're doing um, academic work, engaged or not engaged. The, the idea of ideology um, is a tainted idea in Eastern Europe. It's associated with uh, communism and um, it, um, it resonates very well with the um, uh, radical right rhetoric of let's be neutral, meaning let's go back to normal, meaning let's go back to a traditional order. So to be tainted by this idea of um, ideological is actually dangerous. Um, and I, you know, I don't, I'm not particularly attached to my career. Um, I've been expecting to lose my job for some years now. And um, uh, I'm actually intrigued by the fact that Polish academic um, prestige distribution machine is actually still linked to the Western one. Uh, so to have a book published with Rutledge uh, is valuable, even if that book is really all about how Polish academia and Polish intellectual life has been taken over by the likes of our Minister of Education. So, um, so when I hear my students express emotions in the classroom, um, I'm worried. I think they should toughen up. Um, uh, I, you know, we live in a country that has just welcomed uh, 3 million refugees uh, from uh, Ukraine. Um, there are people living in, you know, in my, in my apartment that have been escaping from the war. Um, most of my students are activists in that sense, right? They are housing, feeding, um, helping uh, women who basically, you know, ran away from their uh, burning homes um, in the last few months. And uh, just to link that up to the academic context in Russia a little bit, I think we should be aware that these connections exist not only on the progressive side, they also exist on the um, ultra conservative and even fascist side. And I'm thinking of the um, scandalous um, and to me really frightening uh, event uh, of two months ago when uh, the rectors of all Russian, basically all of Russian universities made a public statement of absolute loyalty to Putin. 
um, basically, you know, cutting Russian academia off from uh, any kind of commitment to democracy or peace. So um, as much as I, you know, partake in the theoretical debates about empathy, the crisis of care, um, departures from this kind of um, neoliberal academic paradigm, um, I think, you know, my context really uh, calls for a kind of tougher and anal and more analytical stance. Uh, and maybe, you know, I'll, maybe I'll move from that uh, in the next few years, who knows. But right now, my definition of activist, or I prefer the term politically engaged ac um, uh, academic work or scholarship is to produce knowledge, which is useful and accessible to movements for social justice in my particular context, but hopefully also globally. Now, what I mean by useful is that um, it provides the data and thanks Tobias for saying that. I think that's our job. Um, you know, I spent two years, um, uh, you know, in a deep dive into what I now think of as a fascist, as a global fascist movement, the anti-gender movements. And that wasn't fun. It was actually quite frightening at times, understanding the scale of this phenomenon, understanding the connections, the funding. I also joined uh, teams of academics, including some wonderful um, German ones. I'd like to mention Gabriela Dietze, whom some of you might know, she's an Americanist, as well as a feminist scholar, in an effort to understand the connections between right-wing populism and the anti-gender movement. So that sort of usefulness, both in terms of facts, data, but also in terms of frames of understanding, I think our book provides um, a useful reframing of the relationship between uh, right-wing populism and ultra-conservatism, and also a kind of historical overview of how it connects to the rise of the um, religious right in the United States, how it connects to changes within the Catholic Church in the last 30 years. So basically, you know, our book has three is 300 pages of useful stuff, as I've been told. And, um, you know, it exists. And, and then we've made an effort to make it accessible. And uh, open access is something we have to thank um, the Polish and Swedish taxpayer for, but also in a kind of relentless uh, effort uh, to, 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 to raise that money. And I know the book is being downloaded um, all over the world. And I think it's useful to understand besides the, the different positionalities that give you um, privilege that have to do with identity, there are also ones that have to do with geography and the, val and the relative value of your currency. Um, a book that costs 60 pounds might be expensive to a British academic. It's completely inaccessible to a Polish, let alone Ukrainian or Belarusian one. And actually it may be Belarus, uh, Russia or Romania, where our book is most uh, needed. We also managed to get a translation and I'll show it to you because um, I'm kind of proud of the cover. Um, it shows a, um, well, you can see what it shows, right? You have the rainbow dragon being slain by the, uh, by the anti-gender um, saint, which is how we think this movement imagines itself. Um, and again, we made sure that it's cheap. Um, uh, so, and actually an audiobook is being produced now for those who are to, you know, who, who, who needed to be read to them. So I think usefulness and accessibility um, are extremely important. And I think of, femin of academic feminism as the archive of the women's movement. I've always thought that way. And I find to my relief and surprise that this view is much more popular today than it was in the say 90s when gender studies were extremely abstract and inaccessible. And I can see that, uh, you know, people who used to write in very abstract and inaccessible language have become much more approachable, accessible. And I'm thinking of Judith Butler here, whom I actually managed to invite to be interviewed by a number, by, by a bunch of um, high school students with whom I collaborate in an uh, educational um, um, uh, project. And they interviewed her online and 30,000 people listened. So that's it's in terms of like academic activism, it's hard. It's, I think it would be hard to say where does academia begin and activism start in that particular uh, live stream, um, uh, which was, you know, which was done from my bedroom. Uh, so basically, um, I think of academic um, engaged scholarship as service work. Um, and the proper context is uh, movements for social justice. Uh, 
I didn't used to think that um, I, I, when when I believed that Poland was headed for um, liberal democratic um, situation. I think the the position in which my country finds itself makes these um, this puzzle very different. And as much as I'd like to talk about affect and empathy, um, I'm more in the frame of um, toughen up, analyze, understand, and provide the data. Thank you. Well, thank you for this impressive amount of labor um, that you're sharing with us. Yes, I want actually, yes. Uh, I actually would like to open the floor to audience participation. And while you think about questions online and um, here, right here in this classroom, I would like to first move on to Professor Gard because she had a counterpoint to Professor Graf's. Can, can I show Yes, slide? please. Okay. Um, and I, I see we already have a comment, so I want to get back to that, too. Um, let's see. So, let's see. Uh, uh, oh, it worked. Uh, oh, okay. Um, so uh, Agnesia talked about affect over the last 10 years. And so um, I, I firmly believe that truth is a great room, but there are many hallways to get there. Um, and so in the climate justice group of um, the environmental humanities and particularly eco-criticism, um, there's been a movement uh, to uh, restore the severed heads of the academy, which uh, Agnesia is also doing, of course. Um, and this, you know, is sort of rooted in Val Plumwood's uh, critique of, of Western dualisms, that um, scholarship is sort of the severed head, not paying attention to the body. And when we remain in our heads, uh, we lose the energy, the erotic of knowledge itself. And so the eros of climate justice is bringing us back into an embodied response. And that does mean listening to climate grief, uh, climate anxiety, um, and what underlies those fears, which is love, and our sense of interbeing. And so because we are all embodied to cut off, or, or um, perhaps I'm misunderstanding the toughen up as, as um, more of, you know, the traditional masculinist, and so I, I invite clarification uh, after this, um, that uh, this, this suggests that, that we're just like a, a power cord that's not plugged in if we're not running the energy that's in our bodies, which is the emotion, energy in motion. Um, so uh, this was funded by the Rachel Carson Center, um, this existential toolkit for climate justice educators. And um, we met during COVID, so we didn't get to go to the Rachel Carson Center, which was a huge disappointment. But we were online a lot, and we came up with this existential toolkit. And one of the things that Sarah Ray came up with is this field guide to climate anxiety, which is actually targeted at college undergraduates. And it's a workbook that helps people go from paralysis about climate, that it's all too big, there's nothing I can do, which is kind of the lid on how depressed, angry, and impotent students feel about how to engage. And so this is taking the lid off and helping people reconnect with those feelings and then using them as energy and finding a way to do, to do both things. Another uh, person in the group, Jennifer Atkinson, um, came up with this Facing It podcast, which you can actually get on Apple Tunes or something. Um, and it has these episodes on facing climate grief, why climate emotions matter, um, what eco-grief can do to power us, coping with climate despair, hope, and climate uncertainty. Um, and then uh, this is the work that I've been doing since 2016, which is bringing um, uh, embodied awareness through contemplative practices to link to pedagogies that uh, interrogate uh, different kinds of oppression, sexism, racism, heterosexism, and um, how to use those. And we, we draw from the tree of contemplative practices from uh, Sea Mind, Contemplative Mind Org, which is... Um, activism, but it's also writing, storytelling, protest, reading, um, 
uh, silence, centering, expressing gratitude. And so that it, um, when we say uh, turn away from emotions, those are the more toxic emotions. But when we get in touch with the more positive emotions that connect us with the rest of the world, those emotions are juicy. They're like um, gratitude, admiration, connection, reverence. Um, and so it's both... And it's this kind of um, the Tao. How do we hold both together without cutting ourselves apart? And this is, um, you know, again, back to Val Plumwood and her critique of the dualisms of Western culture to which I restored that heteronormative uh, toxic masculinity versus queer or the um, cerebral human versus the multi-species being that were in animal bodies and there's a lot of energy in that. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> you can close that. <laughs> I am tempted to deepen this I, conversation I, around affect, but I really would like to bring in the audience. Yeah. We already have a couple of questions, and I would like to start in the very back. <laughs> she was the first, I'm sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Hi, um, first of all, I would like to thank all the panelists for their incredible and very inspiring talks. And uh, my question is for Professor Gard. Um, I raised my hand right before your presentation on eco-grief, so it, it has given me already so many insights, but maybe you could comment on it a little more. So before I ask my question, I would give you a brief introduction to it. Um, I'm a young scholar and I, I'm teaching my very first bachelor level seminar this semester and it's on ecofeminism. And it's a very small class of uh, five young women and myself. And um, when we were doing our theoretical foundation, we read so many of your texts. So you're sort of a rock star in our class. So, uh, <laughs> so I'm looking forward to going there next week and tell them that I had this chance to ask you a question in person. Um, so one thing I noticed is that our class is an incredibly emotional one. Um, firstly, because they are back from the pandemic and very happy to be together, but at the same time, they're already so weighed down from all the catastrophes and everything. And also during the pandemic, pandemic wasn't the only problem. There were so many things happening, fires, two tsunamis, whatnot. And, um, also because sometimes we talk about such difficult topics in the class. For example, um, Three Mile Island, Lao Canal, and all kinds of catastrophes and destructions, and uh, that make them uh, so aware of their bodies, the, the notion that our bodies are permeable, our environment, and the toxins, and this triggers so much anxiety hypochondria and grief, and they look to me to somehow lift them up. And um, so my question is, how can I help my students channel those feelings into activism without falling into despair? Thank you. Uh, thank you for that question. I'm sure you know, you're not the only person interested in that. <laughs> Um, so the first thing that, that I can say is that um, you can't teach what you don't embody. And so your first step is self-care. That you have to be grounded. You have to cultivate your own way of turning towards your own anxiety, your own climate grief, your own sense of despair and ways to be with it. And then, when you have done that, you can teach your students how to do it. There are some tools. The, the well-known uh, work by Joanna Macy um, on, on working through the four stages of grieving um, and then returning to the work after doing the grief. So the main thing that blocks us in Western culture is our refusal to turn towards the grief. It's the monster under the bed. And anyone who's been a child in here 
knows that if you look under the bed, mostly, mostly it's manageable. <laughs> that it's whatever you feared, you gave it so much energy by not looking at it. And so it's the power of turning towards and being with it. So Joanna Macy is one resource. And another resource, of course, is Sarah Ray's book on climate anxiety, which is very well written and, and uh, targeted for undergraduates, so the language is not impenetrable. And a third source is Rebecca Solnit, S-O-L-N-I-T. And she has a book called Hope in the Dark. And this will help you bring your students back to an analytical critique of news media. Because news media focuses on everything dire because it sells. And people keep looking at their phones to see what's horrible that's happening in Ukraine and everywhere else, because it is happening and, and we should attend to it. But other things are also happening. There's huge resistance. There's huge activist movements. There's huge com movements of compassion. And what uh, Rebecca Solnit does is in that book turn towards the communities that have organized in horrible situations to create hope and empower each other because of that hope and, and commitment to community and well-being regardless of those other circumstances. So, um, you know, you could say decolonize your mind by turning towards your own joy, your love of this earth, and your love of justice. Thank you. I actually think that you and Professor Graf have a similar goal, but just different ways of getting there, yeah, yeah. right? Um, of harnessing that energy to get at a more activist, uh, activist um, impetus. I have three more people on my list for now. Eva Bösenberg, Sabrina Mittermeier, and Sabine Silke. All right. <laughs> okay. I, I... <laughs> um, yeah, we can start with Sabine Zika and then move over to Sabrina Mittermeier. No, that's not, okay. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for all your um, inspiring um, uh, presentations. Um, I have the sense that we're uh, currently facing the reaffirmation of many binarisms that we or scholarship has deconstructed over you know, the last decades. So binarisms of gender, race, et cetera. At the same time, of course, we have also seen that, that political activism or our understanding of political activism has changed completely with uh, digitalization. So um, uh, we, we on the one hand see you know, activism on the net or in the net, while at the same time reaffirming some strategies or nostalgically recalling some strategies of the 1970s. And I wonder how, how you feel about uh, or how you think about uh, activism on, in the net uh, and, and various kinds of social media and it has of course two sides. And I also wonder uh, why I, I don't wonder about it. I'm, uh, it. It's interesting that nobody really talks about what that does to our climate uh, and our energy resources, right? I mean, we're all Googling our ways uh, through the day, and nobody really, I mean, very few talk about what that actually costs, right? Especially now that we're reconsidering our resources uh, in face of the war. Um, so. Uh, I, I'm, I find this really curious in many ways. So um, I would like to hear m more about that because, of course, there. I, I feel, especially with regard to our students, that um, this inactivity or the the, the 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 anxieties that they have, we we need to encourage them more to interact more uh, on a human level, right? I mean, they've come to to interact uh, uh, on, on all kinds of social media, but I hear from students that they don't talk to each other because they're always, they're facing people who are staring into their little apparatus. So, and, and I, I notice this more and more, and I'm, I'm sure that we're sort of um, 
um, glorifying our own uh, um, younger years when we were more, you know, interacting with with uh, our fellow students. But but I, I really see this as a problem that human interaction has changed dramatically through digitalization, as Marshall McLuhan, of course, knew already in the 50s and 60s. So I wonder how you feel about that with regard to you know our our uh, life as teachers, but also our lives as politically engaged scholars. Mm -hmm. Was your question directed at Professor Graf or the entire panel? I just wanted to make sure. Oh, yeah. All right. So I think you were wondering about uh, the de deconstruction of specific binarisms. Well, I wasn't wondering about that. <laughs> yeah. This was an observation. Yes. On the one hand, we see that. So there is a seriality of political activism, right? We have to repeat over and over the same thing, but it's always different, of course, in a different situation. Mm -hmm. At the same time, we're doing political activism also in different ways, and we have redefined it. And, and so I wonder how you feel about that new realm. Uh, how, is it overrated in many ways? We, you know, I, I just, um, I think, and, and the impact on our students with regard to their human interaction and our human interaction, mm -hmm. which changes things also mm -hmm. dramatically or has changed things somewhat dramatically, I think. Mm -hmm. um, perhaps Professor Graf, would you like to respond first? I would. Um, I'm, I'm a little worried that I came off as this heartless bitch from the East, um, you know, who's telling you to toughen up and ignore your emotions. So um, I've actually just taught a, a course on climate grief. So, um, you know, uh, to doctoral students who are quite relieved to talk about emotions. So I, I do that too. When I talk about toughening up, um, uh, maybe I'm underestimating the toughness of that phrase. I mean the kind of ethos that I think Rebecca Solnit, uh, Solnit's writing um, embodies quite well, um, which is emotional, but also um, relentlessly enga engaged um, in social contexts. And I'd just like to draw a distinction that may be controversial. I don't, you know, I'm not part of German academia, so I don't listen to your conversations, but I think it's a useful distinction um, between self-care understood as um, a, a path towards um, joy, courage, compassion, and social engagement. And this has to do with um, what I think of as empowerment through understanding. In other words, um, my, my seminars tend to um, make people feel stronger because they've understood something um, uh, rather than, and this is just a style of teaching, I guess, rather than stronger because they have accessed uh, their difficult emotions. I'm, I'm worried about uh, teachers taking on the role of therapists. I've never, I've always tried not to do that because I just don't feel competent. Um, I also teach cultural studies to psychotherapists. So that, which is a whole different story. Um, so there is that kind of, um, uh, joy and courage reached through understanding and through also attending to issues like the, 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 the scariness of internet and social media and how they contribute to polarization, to the rise of the global right. And those are also my topics. And on the other hand, a phenomenon that I find troubling and that I've been trying to access intellectually, which is um, self-care understood as part of an individualistic ethos, um, which is referred to sometimes as therapy culture. In other words, this idea that um, because we are so fragile, so permeable, um, because the world is ending, there, there's a lot of apocalyptic thinking in those, that we, we have the right or maybe even the responsibility to get all emotional about what we know about the world. And that becomes, I find for many students, a kind of dead end. I find that a lot of my students um, just dropped out um, and I hear that they are depressed. That I, I, I know a lot of scholars who have had mental breakdowns in the last year or two. And of course the context is terrifying um, and maybe in Poland a little bit more so right now than in Germany. The, the, the context of the war is a little bit more urgent. But for me, the response to that um, is the Rebecca Solnit uh, response of, of looking for hope rather than delving in grief. But so that would be my, my, my response to the, 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 the 
earlier exchange. As for social media, I think it's absolutely central to all that we are talking about. And I'm very worried about how that is eating up the energy of students, how um, uh, a lot of students actually uh, despaired about uh, distant learning, but then they got used to it and they didn't actually want to meet in class. There is, I think, we are all traumatized by by what COVID did to um, uh, academic life and what it did to uh, um, uh, activist life as well. I think there's a, there are a lot of people who are clicking furiously on Facebook and they think that what they're doing is activism. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I I share your um, you know I, I share your um, anxiety about this or or I. I believe that this is very problematic. And my response to it is trying to understand it. I've been reading a lot about how social media contribute to um, alienation and uh, how they destroy social movements, which think that they are being actually fed by them and so on. So yeah, I think it is absolutely central to what we're facing. Thanks so much. Before anyone else responds from the panel, I would like us to keep our responses as brief as possible because we are running out of time. And I also would like to bring in some of um, the people who raised their hand um, and give them a chance to contribute to our discussion. Uh, Tobias, Doro. Maybe if you want to go first. Okay, just a short response to that. I think it's a lot about excessive that Agnieszka Graf said, and getting heard in the, on the several platforms that people engage socially and politically, and that includes the digital world as, world as well. So we don't have to be looking back at the good old times because they're not there anymore. And at least looking at the political rights, they are really good and claiming a lot of the platforms and rooms that formerly uh, framed by liberal and other thoughts and that, that's a big danger also academia scholarship and but in a way activists as we heard in means of their results or as as an active scholar so that i, I think that's, that's the main thing thank you yeah maybe i can can just very briefly add um <laughs> Maybe I don't know if this is a generational perspective. Um, I do think I have a little different um, perspective on social media. Um, so because of somebody who, who has been, um, has spent the last two and a half years um, uh, more or less isolating from, uh, from our context to protect my health for me and I think for many other people with uh, disabilities and chronic illnesses, uh, social media has been a lifeline to still connect with uh, people, to connect with other people impacted uh, by the by the pandemic and I see a bit of a um, um, of a um, of a danger that um, uh, that now that um, the pandemic is continuing and um, this despite all um, proclamations to the contrary um, that um, that there is such a such pressure to return to the classroom and that that in-person teaching, is kind of turned into this into this holy grail of teaching that is sort of the um, that this is framed as the only way that teaching and interaction can happen because we're effectively by that also also forcing vulnerable students and staff back into the classroom despite the fact that we're at the same time taking uh, taking protective measures away. So um, I think I may have um, a little more positive uh, perspective on on. Um, uh, <clears throat> Twitter activism, for example. Okay, thank you. I would like to close our discussion with Sabrina Mittermeier's question. Um, does it work? Okay, cool. Um, so I keep thinking about the comment about what we can do pre and post tenure, because in so many ways, I think that's part of the the problem that a lot of us won't get to tenure. And this is more true now than it has ever been, uh, not just in Germany, in the UK, where the humanities departments are being slashed. And I think a lot of this has to do with the climate that we're living in now, because a lot of this happens because of right-wing populism and neoliberalism. And I recently said in another conference that 
you know, fascists burn books and neoliberals will stop paying for them. Um, and we're also, I think, a lot of the sort of scarlet letter A activism that I've been participating in in the last two and a half-ish years has been more about the workplaces that we're in and about the precarity of them, but also the systemic biases of them, the systemic racism, the systemic sexism. Um, and I think that's sort of where the clock is ticking, because if we don't do this now, none of us will even get to do the scholarship anymore that could help anyone. <laughs> Um, so I was just wondering what do you think about the activism that takes place at the workplaces we're at that is less about the scholarly work that we do, but just the existing at departments. Um, and because I think it's become so, so clear to me that the only way we can do this is forming, like actually joining unions, but also forming communities of kinship with each other to counteract the system that we're in. But as soon as we do that, we're perceived as a problem. Thank you. Professor Gard, would you like to? So, so there's, is this on? Yeah. So there's, there's the myth of the one right answer, so you're not going to get that, yeah, right? So you are in an environment in which you are the best judge. And that's true for every person who is not tenured is that you are in an environment, you have all these critical thinking skills, you have organizing skills, you have allies. This is a decision that needs, needs to be made collectively with the people that you're working with. And um, you know, the first rule of organizing is, Tobias might know, is never go alone. So um, this needs to be done a, a, as a community, what you choose to do. Um, and and no, no one outsider can assess the situation as well as you can. And there are times that we're willing to throw everything down and, and that's a good thing. And there are times when we're trying to pace ourselves for a, a greater gain that might be possible in the future. Again, n no single answer. I mean, unless someone has one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure Professor Kraft looks like she would like to share <laughs> another final answer in this question. Oh. I have a but one it might be projecting. I, I do have a one word answer, um, and the word is unionize. Mm -hmm. That's what has been happening in Polish academia a lot, um, with young scholars drawing the older ones in, and also building coalitions, for instance, to protect uh, pre tenured scholars mm -hmm. from uh, stigmatization and from losing their jobs on political grounds. I was mm -hmm. part of such a campaign last year. It ate a lot of my time. Um, there were dozens of phone calls and we were successful. We actually got tenure for one of the most politically engaged uh, feminist mm -hmm. scholars um, in Poland. So mm -hmm. I think there, there is such a thing as activism within academia and you have to be very polite while doing it. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you can't be swear, you know, throwing swear words and banners and carrying banners, but it's, it's actually activist work. I completely agree with you. And neoliberal, between neoliberal academia and ultra conservative um, attacks on academia, we are in a very difficult position where we have to work together. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. I would like to wrap up our discussion, not only by thanking all the plan panelists, mm -hmm. but also by kind of summarizing the key points that were raised in our discussion today. We started by sketching the various political global stakes of our individual scholarship. We deepened the conversation by focusing on very concrete pedagogies um, that channel emotions as well as eventually activism and we very, very powerfully ended by directing our attention toward the political structures that either obstruct or enable engaged scholarship and activism. Thank you so much. And in case I forgot, um, the food trucks are at the Brechtbau, all right? <laughs> right now, run. Thank you, goodbye.